This is Len Trustick. It's January 31st, 2007, and we're back uh, continuing the interview with Bob Metcalf for the Computer History Museum. Good morning, Bob. Good morning. When we left last, uh, we were talking about the formation of 3Com. Uh, <coughs> you had met with Gordon Bell in February of 79, incorporated 3Com June 4th, 1979, and the Dick Standard was published in September of 1980. Talk about what your conception of the future was for 3Com. What were the products you intended to do? What space were you going to be in and not be in? Well, we. You just finished summarizing sort of February and June and September, like da 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 da. But you know they they those events proceeded at real time, not so quickly. So the in February, the with Gordon Bell in his office out in Maynard, the idea was that DEC and Xerox wanted to connect machines together. And then in June, with the addition of in, uh, June-ish, when uh, Intel joined. The way Intel joined, by the way, is I gave a talk at the National Bureau of Standards on um, standardization and Ethernet, and, and there was a man in the audience who came forward and said that he was interested in what I had to say because Intel had a chip technology that the, some sort of NMOS or PMOS, probably PMOS, that uh, they, want, they were looking for a use for, and would I come back to Intel in Santa Clara and pitch him on, you know, that? which I did, and then uh, a man named Phil Kaufman, who worked for Andy Grove, took an interest, and then Intel joined. It was when Intel joined DEC Intel Xerox that um, I figured that there was now going to be an industry. I, you know, what I thought of, I called it in my own thoughts, an Ethernet compatible industry. There had been a plug compatible industry with memories and storage. I figured there was going to be an Ethernet compatible industry. And so there would be companies needed to serve that industry, and that was the general notion. And in fact, the, more, the slightly more general notion was I had begun to theorize that the rate of adoption of new computer technology was being paced by incompatibility. There's the fact you couldn't connect things together. SNA and DECnet didn't work together, and that it was the, all these incompatibilities that were keeping people from finding computers useful or making them useful. So 3Com was a slightly generalized notion of the Ethernet, serve the Ethernet compatible market. 3Com was computer communication compatibility. Its job was to provide compatibility uh, to accelerate the adoption of computer technology. And and you were thinking at the time not only of the low level hardware connection Cap compatibility, but also of the higher level software standards, networking protocols, all yes, of that? Yes, the, the three standards that um, we adopted at inception were Ethernet, of course, but then also TCP, IP, and Unix. We, we were, that was 1979. It's interesting that you chose TCP, IP because Xerox had their own standard for networking protocols, which was not TCP, IP. Yeah, and later we switched back to the Xerox protocols. And then later we switched back to TCP IP. In those days, there was, a, you know, battles that ebbed and flowed. It's, it's all over now. It's TCP IP. But in those days, it wasn't clear. SNA was system network architecture at IBM was the dominant computer communication architecture. I used to like calling it SNA just to upset them. I remember once going to Raleigh, the the center of the universe for uh, IBM's system network architecture, and I gave a talk in which I repeatedly referred to it as SNA. And at first they were blank-faced because they didn't know what I was talking about, and then later they became annoyed when they realized I was talking about SNA. So the so TCP IP had come out of uh, Vince Cerf's uh, seminars at Stanford beginning in the summer of 73, which coincidentally was the same summer that Ethernet was invented. So by 1979, with Vince Cerf's encouragement, uh, people were trying to find, uh, make implementations. So in, our, in, in thinking about what computer communication compatibility meant, it meant Unix and TCP IP. And so that was the full stack of compatibility. So then in um, our first, 3Com's first product was the first commercial version of TCP IP. Uh, for Unix. So your first product was a software product, not a hardware product. It was. Product. That's right. Actually, our first, I'm glad you put it that way, our first product was a book. 
It was called the 3 com Local Computer Network Vendor List. I still have copies. And my wife, Robin, and I published this book. And it, it was in 79. I met Robin in 79. So starting in 79 and 80, what we did is I had the notion that there was going to be this Ethernet compatible marketplace for local computer networking. And so, but no one was with the program yet. No one really knew what a local, I called them, the term LAN had not been coined. And uh, I called them local computer networks. So the Ethernet paper was a local computer network paper. Uh, so I decided there was going to be this market called local computer networking. So I went out and I took product literature from every product I could find that seemed anything related to local computer networks, put it in a Xerox stit in large format to make it difficult to copy. I don't know what I was thinking. And then I wrote a, um, a sort of a preface which said there is this industry called the local computer network industry and here's proof. And it was, uh, so Robin and I published this book. And it became um, the first product of 3Com Corporation. And it was very useful during uh, venture capital fundraising, because the venture capitalists would come through, get my pitch, and, and leave, and never give me any money. But I did tag them for 125 bucks for this book. So we, we had our receptionist set up to, uh, with a Visa machine. And before I'd let anyone out of the office, I'd make them buy a copy of this book. So Robin and I sold 1,000 copies of this book for 125 bucks each for the next five years. And of course, as 3Com started to take off, they said, we can't be in the book business. And so Robin and I took that as a personal business. So I remember for, in the early days, speaking of the th first product of 3Com Corporation, in the early days, 79, 80, 81, 82, Robin and I, every Saturday, would carry an arm full of envelopes full of these books with invoices that we had prepared. And we would mail the books out, and the money would come rolling in. It was a great little business. The, the book changed names. It went from the 3Com Local Computer Network vendor list. It then became the Ethernet Handbook five years later. And we sold it to some big publishing company. I imagine most of the products in the first version of the book were not Ethernet related. Oh, no, there, no, none of them were. And, but in a way, the book backfired because local computer networks, which then became LAN, started to become a hot. And then all those companies that made products that had nothing to do with LAN suddenly decided that their products were LAN products. And I had helped them by including their, their product literature in my little compendium. So anyone who was selling a multiplexer or a modem or anything, it, even if it was 20 years old, they would call it a LAN. And they were, member, they were a LAN company. And so in a way, the book backfired. But that was the first product of 3Com, which became a personal product for five years. But then the real, the real first product was a product called UNET, Unix Networking. And it was an implementation of TCP IP for the Unix operating system. We did this product at the encouragement of uh, Vince Cerf. Um, and uh, we, the source code came from BBN. That is, BBN had implemented TCP IP on an opera contract, and their source code was in the public domain. So we scarfed it up and, uh, and then productized it, which took a lot of work. I, I think we invested several hundred thousand dollars in productizing it. And then we shipped it. And I, I'm guessing that would be December of 1980, which is also approximately the time that ARPA published the Green Books, establishing the TCP IP as a DOD standard. So there was good timing there. But then there was bad timing, because ARPA had paid a man named Bill Joy to implement TCP IP for Unix uh, on the, VAC, the Berkeley VAX um, operating system. So suddenly, we're out trying to sell UNET, and there's uh, Bill Joy giving it away as part of the Berkeley distribution. And fortunately, the Berkeley distribution only ran on VAXs, whereas our software ran on VAXs and PDP-11s, if you remember what they are. So we had a market, and we sold several million dollars of UNET in, over the next few years. And uh, meanwhile, our hardware products were percolating along. So our second product in March of... Uh, March 
I knew it was March. What year was it? March 80, maybe 81. I'm a little vague on this. It was an Ethernet transceiver, a 10 megabit per second. It had to be March of 81. Uh, an Ethernet, the 3C101, the 3C100. It was a 10 megabit per second Ethernet transceiver, which we finally called the brick. We referred to it as the brick. It was about this big. And it had a transceiver cable B and C, uh, not, um, a D series connector over here, and then a big, a big um, vampire tap on the other side, and it ran at 10 megabits per second. Ron Crane was its principal developer, and we started selling that. What network interface hardware was it plugging into? Good question. So 3Com began uh, in parallel with the development of the transceiver, the development of um, what ultimately became a family of three Ethernet adapters, one for the um, Qbus, which was for small PDP-11s, one for the Unibus, which was for big PDP-11s and VAXs, and then one for the Multibus, which was an Intel standard. So, the, uh, so we had the QE, the UE, and the ME were our three uh, products. And those, uh, we did those, um, that development for those three products was paid for by Exxon Office Systems under a contract to us in which we granted them um, the right to um, own these products, fully paid, worldwide, perpetual license, uh, non-exclusive. And it made it a little hard to raise money as the venture capital guys came through. They would say, your technology is owned by the world's largest company. How are you possibly going to compete with them? And I would say, they're an oil company. They're not going to ever make use of these products. They think they are, but I don't think they are, so you should invest in us. And I managed to convince a few people that that was a, that was, a, and that's what did happen. Uh, Didn't they also have a large investment in, Zero, in uh, Zilog at the time? Yeah, Zilog Exxon. was a uh, Exxon company, as I recall, yeah. Uh, when the transceiver came out, were there other non-3Com network interfaces that it could connect to? Who else was making Ethernet interfaces? Xerox. The only other maker is in 1980, Xerox announced its office system, which had Ethernet in it. So in principle, our transceivers could be connected, to, and they were in some cases, to Xerox equipment. But sadly, we had a competitor, a man named Tat Lamb, who had helped Dave Boggs and I build the first Ethernet to begin with. I wonder what ever happened to Tat Lamb. Wonderful man. But anyway, he, he went into competition. So uh, actually, to be fair to Tat Lamb, we went into competition with him because he was the first maker of Ethernet transceivers. And I think Xerox, he won the Xerox account with his flimsy little lightweight transceiver and our big, heavy transceiver. Uh, we didn't win that business. Uh, did you think that making transceivers was key to 3Com's business plan, or were you doing it because Tad Lamb's transceivers were not adequate? For the Tad Lamb's transceivers were just fine, and uh, so were ours. It was just part of a product family. I had a, in, in the 3Com business plan, which I still have copies of, um, I had this product roadmap that was much too big, but it had transceivers and various um, network controllers and servers and gateways and all mapped. The entire computer industry, as you know it today, was on this piece of paper. Uh, and transceivers were on the list. And we knew how to make, Ron Crane in particular, knew how to make transceivers. So we thought we would uh, make them and sell them. And we did. We sold. The, the 3C100 was done by a startup. So it was kind of crude, really. And the final manufacturing step is we poured epoxy into it. Uh, so it was heavy. And, and we put the epoxy in it for, for several reasons, which are amusing in retrospect. One was um, uh, the product was heavy and we were charging $1,000 for it or some huge amount of, what was it exactly? $750 or 1500 I forget which. A large amount of money. So we felt it needed to be heavy so people would know they were getting something for their money. Second of all, uh, our, our first customer was in Japan, and we knew that as soon as we shipped it to, I think it was NEC, they would open it up and cut it into pieces and try to steal our design, and we, we thought we'd just make it a little messy for them, slow them down a little. But there was a, the, actually the real reason we put the epoxy, aside from those two made-up reasons, was 
the design, uh, when it came time to ship, wasn't finished. It had bugs. And in particular, there were some transi uh, transistors. Um, we call them ballerinas. They were suspended off the printed circuit card, um, soldered manually to various points on the card. And it was mechanically unstable. So by putting the epoxy in, we locked the ballerinas in place so they wouldn't rattle around. So we shipped these with epoxy. And so they were a, really an interim product, which Ron Crane um, imagined that we might sell 100 of, or 10 of, or 5 of. We had orders for 20 or 30. Well, we sold 100,000 of them, ultimately, in exactly the same form with the ballerinas in the epoxy. It was, it was, and we kept wanting to, to discontinue the product and substitute enough. We did eventually. Um, but we never, it took a long time to get around to replacing it because it was a popular product. So once um, AT&T, which you may recall in 1980 was still the monopoly, it hadn't been broken up, 84 hadn't come yet, uh, we sold these transceivers to, the, to Western Electric. And after a year of testing and qualifying and all the stuff Western Electric did, they gave it a, what was called a Kellogg number, a KE number, which made an official product of Western Electric, they wouldn't let us discontinue the product or revise it or rev it because they had qualified that particular product. So we were stuck in a way in the end. A difficult to manufacture sort of, it worked just fine I might add, but it was required the epoxy to keep it working. Ron Crane's license plate to this day is 3C100. Thousand dollars seems a lot for a transceiver. You then also have to buy the network interface for your particular machine, which cost how much? The first Ethernet that I sold cost five thousand dollars, including the controller and the transceiver and the transceiver cable. Remember, you had to have a cable from the controller, which plugged into the backplane, and you had this cable that went up into the ceiling to where the transceiver was. So the whole kit and caboodle was five thousand dollars, which is about a factor of a thousand or more expensive than today. Who else was getting into that business? Who was your competition? Well, Tatlam and transceivers, and then um, in terms of exactly what you mean, but in the general the Ethernet business, there were th there were four companies. There was Ungerman Bass, uh, SciTech, and 3Com, all of which were founded in June or July. In fact, I think we were founded a month ahead of Ungerman Bass. In uh, we were June, and they were July of '79. SciTech. I think was also June or July. So Ralph Ungerman and, and um, Mike Pleiner and I all talked about forming companies together, but in the end our egos would not permit it. So we, we each of us started our own networking company. And then there was another company called Interland that came along. Paul Severino ran that one. Uh, those are the ones that come to mind. All the, four of those companies were trying to produce equipment to meet the Ethernet spec. Right. Well, two of them were. Uh, they were. We were all close in competition, but um, the two that adopted Ethernet most aggressively were Interlan and 3Com. Ungman Bass adopted it too, but they they wandered off uh, from time to time into non-Ethernet things. And then SciTech was not really Ethernet at all. That was a broadband Ethernet offering uh, using cable television type technology, but we were all in the same marketplace rattling around there in um, Silicon Valley. The Ethernet spec dictated the use of the thick coax and the vampire tap and the transceivers. What happened to make that evolve away from that to your thin net and the BNC connectors, and how early did that happen? So we, we DEC, Intel, Xerox, uh, then later with IEEE, standardized the half-inch cable, 50 ohm, I think it was 50 ohm, and the, uh, the whole notion of an outboard transceiver with a transceiver cable. But then um, we uh, started developing the first Ethernet integrated circuit. The story is much longer than this, but we went into a, a partnership with uh, um, Seek Technology, which had initially partnered with Ungerman Bass, but then f they, for some reason that relationship fell apart and we stepped in as the network experts to help Seek develop an Ethernet chip. And that chip came ready, and this is sort of an amazingly fruitful story, in June-ish of um, 82, 
2, as I recall, the chip came ready. And uh, we, we had been looking for what card to put it in, in other words, to make the first integrated Ethernet. And we had three prospects. Uh, there was um, Apple, there was DEC, and there was IBM. Apple said, um, no, IBM said, drop dead, we're doing the token ring, go away. That was the crispest answer. Uh, Apple said, yes, we'd like to buy 300 of them. Would you just now develop them for us? And by the way, it has to support the Apple II and the Apple III and the Macintosh. And that was, we eventually built that product, but it was, as you could tell, it had to do too many things. It was fatally flawed. It was bigger than and more expensive than an Apple II, so it was not a good idea. The really complicated case was DEC, who said, uh, yes, We'd like you to develop an Ethernet card using your chip for us, but of course we can't buy it unless you meet a lot of a lot of our manufacturing cri and engineering criteria. And they tortured us for two years and ultimately rejected our product. But in in that event, IBM told us to drop dead. So our um, engineering department said, well, "You got to give the customer what they want. IBM doesn't want anything. Forget that. Let's focus on Apple because Apple said yes." And then we'll fiddle around with DEC for a couple of years, and they'll teach us how to manufacture stuff, which they did. Um, this was not satisfying to me, because in August of 81, IBM had introduced its personal computer. And it seemed, my sense of it was, that it was catching on. You know, the Apple II was not going to be the industry standard, that the IBM PC was actually, I, I don't know, I had a premonition of some kind that the IBM PC would take off. So what I did is I bought one, and I um, put it on a table right outside the engineering department's cubicles. I just put it there. And the rest is history. Of course, the engineers all came out of their cube, Ron Crane, and uh, I keep mentioning Ron, but there are others. They all came out and started looking at this thing, this, uh, this IBM PC. And before I knew it, it was open, and, and there was a card, an option slot. It was this big. And our guys are looking at it and looking at it. You know, we could do that. We could. And eventually the company said, well, maybe we should do that. But this is how the thick coax went away, since you asked. The, uh, this card had to be this big. And then there was going to be this uh, D-series connector, I think we called it, that went out to the transceiver. And we noticed that the electronics in the transceiver, with this chip from Seek, we could take the electronics from the transceiver and put them on the same card and still fit in the IBM PC format. Hmm. That would eliminate the separate box and the separate PC board and the, and the driver receiver electronics to drive the, the cable that went from the controller to the transceiver. And we could just put it all, but you couldn't take this inch, half inch thick coax and jam it into the back of an IBM PC. So we had to think of some other way to uh, network it. So Ron came up with the idea of using thin coax with BNC connectors, a, a traditional standard cable television engineering technology. So we put the transceiver on board and put a little BNC in connector on the side of it so that the coax wouldn't be in the ceiling. It would come right down to the back of the IBM PC. And this was a little awkward because we had just finished convincing the IEEE to standardize the, th the half-inch cable. And here we were, high, high horse standards guys, um, about to ship something that was non-standard. But we argued, coax, coax, same homage. You could, and you could, in fact, hook the thick to the thin. And it would work. So it's approximately the same thing. It's just, look at all these huge advantages. So, so that bec that's when IEEE 802, which had a, um, created a committee called DOT3, 802.3, suddenly began having multiple Ethernet standards. So under the DOT3 standard, there was the thick coax and, the thi and now suddenly the thin coax, which we also then uh, made a standard. So we shipped in uh, September of 1982 the first uh, Ethernet for the IBM PC called the Etherlink. We shipped it in September of 82 because that Seek chip worked. And we pl 
plugged it into our PC card and it quickly worked. And then we went right into production with it and launched it in September of 82. So 3Com was really driving the standards process. It wasn't coming from within the IEEE and the committee. You had invented the ThinNet and, and the IEEE blessed it. Yeah, I would say the thick net was driven by Xerox with Intel and DEC sort of going along with the gag, but it was 3Com that introduced the thin coax. Later we tried to introduce twisted pair, and there we, well, we did introduce twisted pair, but a contending twisted pair standard not was chosen instead of ours, so by then we had lost the ability to, to uh, drive the way, exactly the way we wanted to the standard. Now, Intel was one of the three companies initially formed to do this con standards consortium. Why wasn't Intel producing a chip for the Ethernet and that 3Com was using? So, uh, so Intel joined the DEC Intel Xerox consortium in June, as I mentioned earlier, in June of 79, and began work on the Ethernet chip. And uh, I say began work because they didn't like begin it and end it really quickly. They began it and worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. And their project succumbed to the following temptation. They had this new, I guess it was PMOS. Uh, the reason, by the way, Ethernet ended up running at 10 megabits per second was because the Intel process could run at 10 megabits per second, but not 20 megabits per second, which we had proposed internally. So we slowed it down to 10 megabits per second for Intel, and they began work on their chip. But while they were at it, they said, well, you know, we can put a lot of transistors on a chip. So why don't we put buffering and FIFOs and scatter gather and this option and that option. So the chip became a big Magilla, a big project. And they, I think they sent it to Israel to be done, and they made it a big effort. And the effort bogged down. So Seek was able to come in, do a chip, a very simple chip that didn't have all the you know, scatter gather, fancy memory mapping, or whatever the heck it was, all the rigmarole that went into the Intel chip. So Seek finished first. So we began, uh, so Seek shipped the first Ethernet chip, and we shipped it in the Etherlink as the first Ethernet for IBM PC. And um, Intel eventually came around and they eventually shipped their chip. So I mentioned earlier that we had a multibus card. And our multibus card and our transceiver were adopted by a, a new startup. There were a bunch of startups doing workstations. Apollo was one. Um, I remember going to Apollo in uh, Hartwell Avenue in 79 or 80 and con trying to convince them they should use Ethernet and, and uh, TCP IP and Unix. But they had started just a little bit too early, and they didn't really see the merit of Ethernet or Unix or TCP IP. So they started a workstation company that didn't use those three standards. And remember, Mr. Nelson had been at Prime and DEC, as I recall. And he was into a token ring-ish sort of thing. So they developed their own LAN, their own operating system, their own protocols, everything. This other startup got started a little later. 82, as I recall, in uh, Silicon Valley, a company called Sun. Um, Andy Bechtelsheim had come to 3Com, then a graduate student at Stanford, and said he had this workstation that he'd been building with Forrest Basket over there at Stanford, and maybe since 3Com was learning how to build things, we could build this workstation and sell it, and he'd love for us to do that. And we said, no, Andy, we're focused. And we do, Ethernet, we do Ethernet cards and software. So if you ever need that, you let us know. So he went off and stumbled into Kleiner Perkins and, and Vinod and, and so on and started Sun Microsystems and then adopted our product. So he adopted our multibus product and our transceiver product. And uh, we started shipping it to this workstation company. By the way, there were a lot of workstation companies. Apollo and Sun were just two of, I don't know, 20, I'm guessing, maybe only 10, but a big number, all of whom became our customers for this multibus card and this transceiver. So that was our early business. Then I began to notice um, I was on the phone with Vinod Koshla every Monday morning. And uh, we'd ship them 50 Ethernet cards the previous week, and we were scheduled to ship them 50 this week. But Vinod would call and say, well, we need 60 this week, not 50. 
And then, and he would say, and since we're going to buy 60 instead of 50, they should be a little bit cheaper. And then I would argue, but you didn't forecast 60. You only forecast 50. So I'm going to have to expedite production. So they really have to be a little bit more expensive. And this price negotiation, every Monday. And every Monday, so a weekly price negotiation with my number one customer, weekly, Vinod, on the phone. He's gone on to bigger and better things. But then I noticed it was 100. And then it was 150. And then it was 200. And we, so we would get a $1,000 or a, a fraction of $1,000 on each of those. And he was getting $40,000 on each of those. So hmm, maybe we should have done Sun after all. So we were, um, so that was in the 81, 82 time frame. We were, we were Sun's supplier and we were shipping. We were not Apollo's supplier because they had chosen to go their own way. Were you concerned that a manufacturer like Sun might eventually start manufacturing their own Ethernet board? Did that happen? Uh, that did happen. Uh, Sun told us, look, you know, eventually Ethernet's so fundamental, which we believed also, it's going to be on the motherboard. So we really appreciate your products and uh, we'd like to keep buying them. But you should know that we're going, you know, they were very straightforward about it and we understood. Uh, which led to the following strange decision in, um, in 82. Uh, our, we were selling what we call the MEs, the multibus Ethernet cards, about this big, I forget the exact price, but it was like five or six or seven hundred dollars each. And that was our main business. We were selling hundreds per month. It was a you know, big deal. With a transceiver and a, and a transceiver cable and some software often. And uh, we, th our engineers had come up with a way of doing the next generation of the ME. And what do you think we called it? the second generation of the ME. We call it the ME2 or the ME2. And the uh, decision was, should we, and meanwhile, we're developing the Etherlink for the IBM PC in the same lab. And we don't have that many engineers. So it was a question of where are we going to invest our energy and priorities. And the sales force said, you got to do the ME2. They didn't call it the ME2. They call it the ME2. But Bechtelsheim and company, Vinod, you know, they're telling us they're going to design us out. Intel is now, Intel, who invented the multibus standard, they're entering the marketplace. DEC had finally gotten around to introducing multibus products. So, and Interlam, maybe not DEC, but Interlan, uh, our uh, arch competitor of the day, was, um, introdu had introduced the multibus controller. And we were head to head with Interlan, I remember. They were our sharpest competitor. Um, so we decided not to do the Me Too product, uh, and aptly named, too. We said, we're going to focus on the IBM PC. It was a great decision in retrospect. So we conceded the um, multibus market, which Sun was going to integrate into its motherboard. We conceded it to Interland and then ultimately to um, Intel. Of course, DEC had gotten around to doing Qbus and Unibus adapters, which we were also selling. So we conceded that market to them. And we just focused on the Etherlink for the IBM PC and started shipping them in 82. And I, I noticed really quickly that 100 was a small number. And that selling 100 cards to the sun was nothing like selling 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 or a million cards into the IBM PC market, which is where it went. These were based on the Seek IC, or were you also using the Intel IC at the time? Well, for a long time, we used the Seek chip. And then we um, other chips came. National Semiconductor had one, and uh, Intel had one. I think those are the principal ones. So we, we taught those companies how to compete with us, in particular National Semiconductor. We taught them how to build Ethernet chips for us, and then they all introduced their own cards to compete with us. And ultimately, unsuccessfully, I might add, we've warded them off. We fought off Intel, and we fought off National for a very long time, a decade or two. Uh, but they, it, was, it was a nasty scene where we, in, in order to use their chips, we had to teach them how to design their chips. And then when they started shipping their chips, then some genius at National and some genius at Intel said, well, may, why don't we make the cards? And so they started making the cards. And we had to fend them off, which we did, as I'm proud to say, we did. 
Was that the major revenue source for 3Com, the uh, network interface cards? Were you also selling software separately? Were, were there other we hardware so, uh, Yes, 3Com had diversified. Uh, the, the principal revenue generator was the Etherlinks, but we also sold network operating system software and servers and uh, gateways and you know various software products around it. But the card was the driving the driving revenue product. Where was Microsoft in all of this? When you were writing network operating systems, were they interested in that space? Were they encouraging of your oh, activity? Yes. So Bill Gates and I, at that time, uh, we were still speaking. I don't think he likes me much anymore because I have been critical of the Microsoft monopolistic anti-competitive behavior over the years. But in those days, Microsoft was 30 people and we were 15 people and um, UNET, our first software product, we co-announced with Microsoft. So Microsoft had decided in, ninth, this was in 79 and 80, had decided to make Unix their strategic operating system. What'd they call it? They had a special name for it. Xenix, X-E-N-I-X. -E and we, with our TCP IP software, were going to be their network operating system partner. That is, UNET was going to be part of Xenix. So when we announced that, uh, Steve Ballmer, who had just joined the company, and I, co-announced it. We had a press reception in Woodside, California. Steve was there. And uh, Microsoft, then I'm guessing 35 people, was uh, had making a big thrust into the Unix market with Xenix and we were their networking partner. Then exactly, that was in August of 80. Exactly one year later in August of 81, IBM announced the IBM PC and Microsoft's strategic operating system was no longer <laughs> Unix, it was now suddenly DOS. And, and uh, 3Com made the shift at exactly the same moment. So we just, we said, oh my goodness, we thought it was going to be Unix, but now we think it's going to be DOS. So then we shifted our efforts to DOS. We went from TCP IP to XNS, and we went from Unix to DOS. We stuck with Ethernet. Explain why you made the transition from TCP IP to XNS. Uh, Xerox at that time was, um, there's a lot going on here, but Xerox had begun the notion that it was going to publish its specifications for XNS. And XNS was the dominant internet working protocol at that time. The, there was no TCP IP. It was in a few universities here and there, and, and um, it hadn't even become the, it wasn't even in the internet. The internet was still uh, uh, NCP, network control protocol. So TCP IP wasn't obviously the choice, and Xerox had much more. Xerox was a bigger company than DARPA. So it, uh, so, and we knew XNS, and we believed XNS was better than TCP. They're very similar, but we saw certain reasons to make them, make XNS better. And Xerox was pushing now for the, for a, a brief interval of a year or two, was trying to make all of its protocols into an industry standard. So we adopted XNS because we knew it, we had developed it at Xerox and because it looked more promising because Xerox was behind it. So we, we used XNS to develop our own network operating system to run under DOS. Go back to uh, 1979 uh, when I caught wind of the fact that Deck, Intel, and Xerox were going to cooperate to make a standard based on Ethernet and that 3Com should be founded to serve the Ethernet compatible marketplace and computer communication compatibility in general, hence 3Com. And in the Valley, there were these other couple of guys who also had a vague notions that they wanted to do networking too. There was Mike Pliner and his cabal of um, getting started. They were sort of out of the National Security Agency, MITRE Corporation, and they wanted to do networking. And then there was this guy named Ralph Ungerman who was from Zilog, and, and uh, he had done some networking with uh, Judy Estrin and others at um, Zilog, and he was going to start his company, and I was going to start my company. But we, someone was introducing us to each other, and we were talking about maybe we should start a company together. And I remember I went over to Ungerman Bass, which was at, uh, I guess it was Ralph's house in Los Altos, in his living room, and there was Charlie Bass, and there was Ralph Ungerman, and um, there were two other guys, Kennedy. Uh, and a four, John, uh, Davidson, John Davidson, the four of them. And we schmoozed and played racquetball. 
and um, I played racquetball against Ralph Ungerman, and I'm a, I'm a racket sports player, and I've been playing them for many, many years, and it didn't surprise me that I could beat Ralph Ungerman because he was not, he hadn't spent his whole life with a racket in his hand as I had, so I beat him. It's not good to beat Ralph Ungerman at anything. He's a very competitive fellow, and that was the end of our um, idea of starting a company together. I think, because I'd beat him at racquetball. Now, maybe that's simplifying, oversimplifying. So he, uh, I opted to found 3Com on June 4th. He had founded Ungerman Bass. Yeah, one of, the, one of the jokes I've loved to tell is, I said, yeah, Ralph, we should start a company. Let's see, you're Ralph Ungerman, I'm Bob Metcalf. We'll call it Metcalf and Ungerman. And uh, for some reason, he uh, ended up founding Ungerman Bass. And have you noticed that Bass should come before Ungerman alphabetically, but it was Ungerman Bass. And I, that could have been the problem. Metcalf Ungerman probably didn't sit well with him. Maybe he wanted it to be Ungerman Metcalf. I don't know. Anyway, I decided not to call my company Metcalf anything and gave it a, a, a different kind of name. You gave it an unusual name. It starts with a digit. Uh, did that ever cause problems? Always, yes. Uh, my whole life, I've sp a significant fraction of my entire life to date has been getting the E on the end of Metcalf and getting the three on the front of 3Com. So it was the number three, capital C, small o-m. That was my branding. And so for years I would have to say that. The, the number three, capital C, small o-m, 3Com. Computer communication compatibility. I, I didn't like the S on communications, so I would always say, Computer communication compatibility, just to emphasize, no S. I, I don't know why we choose to spend our, so had I to do it over again, the joke goes, I would have called it candlestick networking. Why candlestick? Because years later, after I left 3Com, 3Com paid Candlestick Park, the baseball stadium, football stadium, millions of dollars to get it renamed 3Com Park. But if I'd called it candlestick, <laughs> networking <laughs> systems, we could have saved all that money and just called it. But anyway. That's good. <laughs> so you made the uh, switch from TCP to IP to XNS for the IBM PC implementation. Um, how did that go? Uh, did the product sell well? Did, uh, were you the dominant supplier in that area? It would be an understatement to say the product sold well. We lucked out. The IBM PC caught on. And, um, and the channel of distribution appropriate for us also caught on. So much to our good fortune, computer retailing started. And the principal, the one that, there were many of them, Computer Land, Xerox had retail, IBM had retail, uh, but the key one for us was a company called Business Land, which was perfect for our product. So Business Land set out to, to serve the high-end business personal computer user who needed networking. So we launched our product through all of them, but especially Business Land. And it was that channel of distribution combined with our product, combined with the sex, success of the IBM PC, our numbers just took off. So we started shipping in September of 82, and we went public in March of 84. As the, and the, the notion of selling hundreds, 50 a week to Sun and arguing with Vinod, that went away. Because we then went, uh, we argued with different people, the, um, the retailers, and we sold through um, PC distribution and, and got a lot of leverage there and just scaled up and were selling thousands and then tens of thousands and ultimately millions. Who was supporting this product? Networking was new to most of the people buying it. They probably needed some hand-holding. Uh, were you doing that? Or was well, we set wondering? out initially to do that. We had, had a support organization and then we trained a lot of the each of these high-end retailers had their own um, outbound uh, enterprise sales forces and associated support organizations so we trained them how to support networks and um, and that was rough going um, because networking was new and we you know our products weren't great I mean they were great but they weren't perfect so they required support but it, somehow it got done. People learned how to use and support the products, and we made them better and better over time. Um, but it took off pretty quickly. It wasn't a, a long slog. So we were profitable when we, 
we were profitable when we went public in uh, 1984. We, I remember when I first met the um, Wall Street financial community, they told me things, taught me things that were, I assumed were rock solid, almost constants of the universe. Like in order to go public, you need to be profitable for four quarters in a row with increasing profits and a high degree of confidence of the next four quarters. So we did that and we went public. Of course, since then, I've seen a lot of companies go public that didn't have to do any of that stuff. And I've always wondered why I took them at their word that this was just the way you'd had to do it. Do you remember any of the financial parameters at the time you went public in terms of revenue, how much money you raised in the offering? Uh, we raised $11 million, which isn't very much. So, you know, our first venture capital round in 81 was 1.1, I sold a third of 3Com for $1.1 million. Then a year later, we raised two point, these are round numbers. A year later, we stepped it up two or three times and raised another 2.2 million. Then another year later, we stepped it up some more and raised 4.4 million. Then we went public and raised 11 million. And then a year later, so with each of those events was a year. We did a secondary and we raised 25 million. But the 11 million and the 25, we never touched. That is, we were, we were well, maybe we touched them, but um, that was insurance. That was, those events, those finan financing events were liquidity events more than fundraising events. How big was the company at the time you went public? You know, I'm a little vague on that, but I suspect we had 10 or 15 million in revenue when we went public. How many employees? I don't remember that. Must have been hundreds, a small number of hundreds. I don't remember. So. What about the uh, upper levels of software? You were selling XNS uh, protocols for the IBM PC. Uh, were you doing servers, file transfer software, all of the rest of it? Yes, yeah, so we, we offered a network operating system, uh, which we called the Ether series. And it's, we actually did several generations, but the first one was the Ether series, uh, Ether disk. Ether Mail, Ether is, you know, like there was the Visi series, you may remember, Visi Calc, Visi whatever. We parroted that as the Ether series. And uh, our products did PFMTS. S turned out to be the important one. But there was print, so sharing of printers, filing, sharing of disks, terminal, providing terminal access to associated mini computers and mainframes. PF, oh, mail, uh, email, LAN email, which was uh, unheard of. And then S, stubs. I'll explain in a moment. Print, file, mail, terminal, and stubs. That's what our software did. So that was our network operating system. And all this of this was written within 3Com from the ground up? From the ground up at 3Com using XNS. And it was, um, S was an API that application developers could use, stubs. That's why it was called stubs. And that turned out to be the important one. So we, we needed to do our own network operating system because there wasn't one for DOS. Microsoft hadn't paid any attention to it because the, the whole thrust in the early PC movement was the standalone, self-contained, you had everything you needed. You had a printer, you had a disk, you had everything, it was all yours. And um, Bill and others just didn't think about networking. Of course, that recurred later. Uh, so we had an open field. Well, to put it another way, in order to sell our cards, we had to have software that made use of the cards because no one else was doing that. And that situation changed in 85 or so when a company called Novell came. And Novell um, did an, a new network operating system, their own, Netware. It used XNS. So XNS had an install base much larger than TCP IP for a very long time. For much lo it was called NetWare, and it was called uh, the Ether series, and then 3 Plus Open was our, another one of our network operating system generations. And NetWare had the feature that it, uh, Novell didn't sell cards. So they, they would use anybody's cards, including our competitors. And then the principal technical advantage they had over us which caused them to win. They won the software battle. The network operating system battle of the mid-80s, NetWare won. They won it because they did file sharing and we did disk sharing. 
I should hasten to add that in 1982, IBM came out with uh, their version of their PC that had a hard disk in it. It was called the X, the IBM PC XT. It had a huge hard disk in it, which was quite innovation, innovative. It, it was a 10 megabyte hard disk. And uh, our customers wanted to buy very few of those because they were expensive and no one really wanted, could think of how to use 10 megabytes of hard disks. So ether links could be used to share a hard disk. So PFMTS, we did disk sharing. So you could buy a work group of PCs with one XT and hook the printer to the uh, XT and use its hard, and then all these PCs here would use the XT to share its printer and disks. That was the original value proposition. Sharing that expensive 10 megabyte, I, did you hear me? 10 megabyte disk. I know we don't say M, the M word anymore, but a, a 10 megabyte disk and then a printer. You know, a, a dot matrix printer or, or later uh, laser printers would be shared using this networking software. And the disk was shared in the sense of uh, partitioning the disk so that each computer remotely had access to a section of the disk but couldn't see or could see partitions couldn't of others? Couldn't see. Well, initially couldn't, later could, but that's, that was the flaw in our, we made it, I wish I had attended the meeting and I wish I'd had the foresight where we decided to do disk sharing instead of file sharing because that's how Novell beat us because they came in with file sharing and their first application were multi-user accounting packages which needed file sharing and ultimately we sort of cobbled that together with our disk sharing software but they by that time had achieved critical you know escape velocity and they blew past us there was this funny period where 3com was easily five times bigger than novell but respectable newspapers and analysts would report that Novell had 70% market share. Well, that's not possible, but they had, with software, they had sort of transformed the market to be really not the market for networking, but the market for network operating systems in which they did have 70% share. But we were selling all the doodads that went under their software. So their software became very important to us because it, um, grew the market for our products ever more. We still made the best cards, so even though they would use anybody's, ultimately Novell began making its own cards. And we drove them out of that business because they didn't know what they were doing. Our products were cheaper and faster and better than theirs, and, and that ultimately went, and they went back to the high margin software business, and they were helpful to us. So they, they, it was co-opetition, as Ray Norda, may he rest in peace, passed away recently. Uh, Ray Norda introduced to us the term coopetition, which meant we're competing, but we're also cooperating. Let's make that work, and we did uh, with Novell. So eventually you became the hardware supplier, Novell became the software supplier, uh, Microsoft became the underlying operating system supplier. Is that a fair representation? Well, much later, closer to 1990, uh, Microsoft, you know how Microsoft takes the leader in a segment and aims at it and then kills it, you know, like Lotus, for example. Uh, but uh, like uh, digital research and then Lotus. So they, this, they set their sights on Novell, and Novell was selling the leading network operating system, and Microsoft decided to kill them. So they came to us and they said, since you know how to do networking and we don't, why don't we partner and we'll kill Novell together? By kill, I mean in a very positive, competitive sense, offer better products that customers will prefer. That's what I meant when I said kill. I, and. Um, uh, so we entered a, a co-development with IBM, IBM, Microsoft, and 3Com to do the IBM land manager for OS2. And in the course of that, um, Microsoft stole our products and our customers and um, finally drove us out of the network operating system business in a very bitter, h horrible partnership, typical of Microsoft partnerships where they um, and this is when my this is when my relationship with Bill became strained, because <laughs> we wrote uh, that was around the time I was leaving 3Com, and the company wrote off 90 million dollars one quarter because of this defunct partnership with Microsoft, well, in which they failed, by the way, with our technology even as good as it was, they failed to uh, to um, unseat Novell uh, in 1990. Well, how much of that has to do with the failure of OS2? A lot of it had to do with the failure of OS2, but a lot of it had to do with 
a predatory behavior by Microsoft. I remember the, the guy that we were working with, wasn't me exactly, but guys in my company and guys in Bill's company did all this together. And uh, as the relationship's falling apart, he's a famous guy, I won't mention his name, but he, he left Microsoft and became very famous. And now he feels about Microsoft the way I do now that he's not there anymore. I remember once he said, you made a mistake. You trusted us. <laughs> and, I, I wanna, and that's what we had done. We had built a contract, which they then exploited uh, and abused us and took our networking. But they failed in the course of, of um, punishing us, damaging us. They uh, failed to unseat Novell for a very long time. Back when Microsoft was telling you that you knew networking and they didn't, did they ever try to buy you? No. You were um, almost bought by Convergent, but that was later. And uh, that's not accurate what you just said. Uh, we uh, failed to buy Convergent. That is, we were buying Convergent and that, that um, acquisition fell apart famously. But that was later. When was that? That was, not I think, so 80, later. 86. Was it 86, really? Well, we, we three com began doing mergers, and we did it really badly. And Convergence, the most famous case, but we did, we, uh, we did manage to acquire Bridge Communications, and that was a horrible mess. Then we failed to buy Convergent Technologies, and then we failed to buy Echelon Networks. And, and 10 others of, that we either succeeded or failed in buying them, but none of them worked out very well. It wasn't until I was gone, maybe I was the problem, uh, that the company became much better at M&A for a long streak under uh, Eric Benamou, and then Eric made his mistake and he bought U.S. Robotics, uh, merged with U.S. Robotics, and that was horrible. A horrible Let's go back debacle. to the earlier days of the company. Talk about um, what it was like inside the company, what the culture was like. Did you have a strong notion that, that you wanted to establish a particular kind of company and how did that change over the years as it grew? Well, the, the culture, uh, the whole topic of culture was introduced with the arrival of Bill Krauss, who we whom we recruited from HP in 1981 to be our president. And so he came from HP, where he had been for 14 years, and so we became, we transplanted the HP culture into 3Com. We were a three, and a lot of the people came from HP into 3Com. So Bill and Dave were the um, culture uh, mentors of the company. They never came over, but um, so we were management by walking around. We, we had cubicles. We were just HP through and through. Before Bill's arrival, because of my inexperience in business, all of our business cards had no titles on them because I, I had this notion that that would be, const we were so small, everybody had to do everything. A title was kind of a bad thing. Bill arrived and immediately we all had titles on our cards and, and then it took me a, a year to notice that it worked. The, you know, I had originally thought that title was a form of compensation. You know, you can, you compensated someone by making them important, by giving them some inflated title. That's not what titles are for, I learned from Bill Krauss. Titles are to communicate what people do so that you can relate to them better. So he introduced all these titles of pr product marketing manager, director of product marketing, channel marketing, uh, engineering manager, and director of engineering, vice president of engineering, all titles that had come right from HP's hierarchy. And what I saw is that they worked. They, they, they gave the company cohesion and communication. So everyone had titles. And we were careful not to use titles as a compensation uh, schema, but as a communication tool. And so we had the HP culture. What we, was your title, and how was your relationship with Bill? Well, let's see. I was uh, initially, I was um, chairman president, chief executive, vice president of engineering, vice president of sales, vice president of marketing. It was just me for six months, so I had all of them. Then, um, then I became chairman, chief executive, and president. 
And I remember Howard was VP engineering and manufacturing, and uh, Ken Morris was VP sales and marketing briefly, seven months. And then Bill came, he became president, and I was chairman and chief executive, but everyone else, chief financial officer, and everybody else reported to Bill. That lasted for a year. And then I became chairman and vice president of sales and marketing, and Bill became president and chief executive. And that persisted for another year or two. And then I, I held a number of positions, general manager, vice president of marketing, division. I started the software division. I started the workstation division. Then I ran all of hardware for a while. So I was there for, at the corporation per se, formally for 11 years. But then there was the year before and the year after. So I was really there for 13 years. And your relationship with Bill sounds like a good working relationship. It was fantastic. There was a there was there were some awkward moments in the transition where he became chief executive. There was a bad month or two, but to uh, both of our credits, um, you know, it was traditional in those days for the founders of Silicon Valley companies to flounce out after the adult supervision arrived, and I was close to flouncing. You know, Steve Jobs had flounced out and sold all of his stock in Apple and. And Steve was one, is one of my gods, and so it, was, it would have been very easy for me to flounce out at that time. But I didn't. I uh, you know, sucked it up, and for a very good reason. Because in the early founding days of the company, I interviewed venture capitalists prior to raising any venture capital. I just interviewed, I took them to lunch. I didn't ask them for money. I just asked them for advice. You know, if you want money, you ask for advice. If you want advice, you ask for money. So I was asking for advice, and, and I learned these three lessons, which I remember to this very day. The three reasons why startups fail. One is the uncontrollable ego of the founder. Two is lack of focus, and three is undercapitalization. So then later, when I went back to the venture capital community to raise money, I would say, before they had a chance to blurt it out, I would say, here are the three mistakes I am not going to make. A, I have decided that it's more important that this company succeed than uh, that I run it. And two is we're going to, even though I have this business plan that shows a million products, I've, trust me, we're going to focus on a few of them. And three, I'm here raising money because we're not going to be undercapitalized. So that worked. Uh, eventually, it was, that was another difficult period, but um, we did succeed in raising first class venture capital using that sales technique that is basically raising the three objections in advance and answering them before they were. Um, now, what question of yours was I just answering? Relationship with Bill. Right, so, um, so my venture capitalists helped me. Oh, so I, I, I decided that the success of the company was more important than running it, so I set about building a board of directors, a first-class board of directors, and I tricked the VCs into this in a way a shrewd maneuver. During the, um, I was out raising venture capital, and I had heard that one of the problems with venture capitalists is that they, at each firm, there were the, the, the experienced guys who had founded the firm, and then there were all these MBAs that worked for them, the associates. And if you weren't careful, you'd take money from a VC, and then they'd put one of these MBAs on your board. And it was seemed, it got important to me that that not happen to me because I've always resented MBAs. They got, always got paid more than I did, and I was smarter than them, and I never understood that. So I wanted to be sure that I didn't get stuck with any of these young MBAs on my board of directors. So when it came time to negotiate the venture capital deal, they always wanted to have, the VCs wanted to have the right to appoint a director. And I just refused. I said, no. Trust me, I'm going to recruit a good board of directors, and uh, no, you don't have a right. I will not grant you that right. And they didn't like this, and it was part of the diff my stubbornness was part of the difficulty on this part. But I did in each case. So at uh, Melcor Venture Management, run by Jack Melcor, a fabulously successful venture capitalist who very few people have heard of, uh, I asked Jack, he said, by the way, Jack, if I asked you to be on my board, would you be on my board? Now, this is right after I had an argument with him about not giving him the right to appoint a director. So he said, yeah, I, sure, I'd do that. And then at um, NEA, Dick Kramlick, another famous venture capitalist, with whom I fought over the issue of board composition, 
Dick, if I asked you to be on my board of directors, would you say yes? And Dick said, sure, I'd be happy to be on your board. And then at Mayfield Fund, where I had, again, fought bitterly over board composition, Wally Davis, who was uh, the guy interested in us, I said, Wally, if, you, if I asked you to be on my board, would you be on my board? And he said, sure, I'd be happy to be on your board. So right after the deal closed, I asked all three of these guys to be on my board. So I got three top drawer VCs and no young MBAs on my board. And this worked out beautifully because these three guys had started 100 companies and they knew how to start companies. And together we recruited Bill Krauss, which gets around to your question again. And uh, Bill was, uh, had been at HP for 14 years, was running the uh, computer systems division there that sold uh, MPE uh, HP 3000s. And so he knew sales and marketing, he knew how to run, he had scale, he had 500 people working for him. So we convinced him to join the company, gave him a big hunk of equity uh, to be, and, and here was my naive notion. I was gonna be the chairman, chief executive, and the strategist and the visionary, and Bill was gonna be the president and chief operating officer and make the trains run on time. But this is a standard broken uh, model of governance. So very quickly it became clear that Bill Krauss was a good choice and he wasn't gonna put up with me being chief executive. And so, the, so I made a mistake and I predicted that the company would go like this over a certain time period. And I was wrong by six months, only six months. So I wasn't that far off, but that six months cost me the CEO ship because the, the company uh, found itself, that and other events, <laughs> which we could go into, in which Ethernet was doomed. Famous headline, Ethernet ist ein Superflop out of a German newspaper. Immediately my revenue went to zero. Anyway, during this zero revenue period, with expenses going up as we ramped our staff with our newfound venture capital, it became clear we were flying toward a wall and the company really needed adult supervision. And that's sort of when Bill became chief executive. But the company was so desperate for sales and marketing, I became the vice president of sales and marketing. Now that's really strange. But the and that was a measure of our des uh, desperation, which was, okay, we don't have any sales in Mark. We don't have any sales. And uh, Bob, you can't be chief executive anymore because you, you, know, you were wrong about, it didn't go like this and you're not allowed to be wrong. Then Bill, he's just better at running things or he should be chief executive, all of which in retrospect was exactly the right thing to do. But um, I turn out to be a, not a bad salesman and my board realized that. And they also realized that Ethernet was an evangelism situation in 19, when did this happen? 82. It was an evangelism play and I'm an evangelist. So I became head of sales and marketing. And plus I had Bill who's an excellent sales and marketing guy as my boss now, although I was his boss because I was chairman. So it was complicated. Actually, it was the fact that Bill and the board wanted me to be vice president of sales and marketing is, is why I didn't flounce out. Because they were saying, we're just gonna change things to give people their jobs that they're best suited to do and you should really be head of sales and marketing and Bill should really run everything. So um, that made sense to me. And plus I had recruited this board. I had carefully recruited this board of which I was very proud to make this exact decision. So how could I flounce out? I couldn't. So I stayed and it worked out. On the other hand, your background was on the technology side. So why didn't you become VP of technology, engineering? Uh, because my aptitude, uh, because I'm not actually a deep, 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 deep engineer. And I'm certainly, not, although I've done it, and I'm, I'm not really a, an engineering manager, Larry Birnbaum by then was our VP of engineering. Um, so, so my specialty in life has always been that among the engineers, I was the jock. And among the jocks, I was the engineer. And among the sales and marketing people, I was the engineering guy. And among the engineering guy, I was the sales and marketing. I'm always better at the thing you're not good at. So we needed me to be head of sales and marketing. And it worked. I mean, that is that, that thought that said, okay, we're gonna just send Bob out to get orders and grow a sales force. And it was a lot of personal selling. The sales force was, there was no sales force. Uh, that was the first thing I did was uh, appoint three salesmen from inside the company who had been doing other things. 
Mike Caliburka had come from HP and he was putatively our head of sales, but he wasn't, he had none. So when I became head of sales, I said, Mike, you take care of the Western region. And that, so then we have one salesman and me. So then there was Dave DePew, who had, we had just recruited as an engine, a production engineer from Berkeley. And the company was small, so everybody knew everybody. And I knew Dave DePew's father had been a lifelong successful salesman. And DePew was single, so he could move on a dime. So I, and we didn't have any production problems because we had no sales. So having a production engineer was a bit of overkill. So I gave DePew, convinced him to take the eastern region of the United States. And one, that next week, he moved to Washington, D.C to become head of the Eastern region, a guy who had never sold anything before. And then one of our product marketing guys, actually, I tried to convince this woman in product marketing, her name then was Marlene Martin, very good contributor, but we didn't need any marketing, we needed sales. So I tried to convince her to be central region and she quit. So Dave uh, Colson was another product marketing guy and I, I gave him the central region. So Depew had Eastern, Halliburka had Western, and Colson, another mar product marketing guy, not a sales guy, gave him the central region. And, and David Colson was English, and he had an English accent. So I gave him rest of world. So Depew had the central region and everything outside the United States. Depew had, that was Colson, Depew had the East Coast, and Halliburka had the West Coast. And, and we, guess what? We started getting orders by just having a sales force. It was a very a big breakthrough concept. Send people to go ask for orders, and guess what? You get them, and they, they started happening. So then the, I grew the sales force. Uh, the next wave was to get a search firm and then to recruit actual, real regional managers for three or four regions. That was the next step, and then, uh, and then sales became too technical. Not technical, engineering technical, but sales compensation, territory management, um, uh, sales tools, uh, dealing with distribution. It became outside of my skill set. So then we went and recruited um, an actual VP of sales, Chuck, I think his name was. So I, and what we learned there is that people have operating ranges. So I was good for the first, I went from zero to a million a month. Then Chuck, I think, went from a, no, it was Mike, went from a million a month to five million a month. Chuck went from five million a month to 10, 10 or 15 million a month. And then Bob Finocchio came along and he took us to, you know, billions. So each of these sales guys succeeded in his range and then had to be replaced as we got, as we scaled up. And in that story, since I mentioned Depew, Depew succeeded. That was a bad decision with a good outcome that has sent the wrong guy to the East Coast and he succeeded wildly. So much so that his next promotion was not to be the head of Eastern Region, his promotion was to be the head of the Northeastern Region. And then he succeeded at that so wildly, his next promotion was to be head of the Washington Region. And then his promotion after that was to be head of OEM sales in the Washington Region. Each of those was a promotion for Dave. His compensation went up and his uh, responsibilities were going up if you count from the bottom. If you count from the top, he was being demoted each time. And there was an interesting lesson there about how big in big companies, the people grow faster than the company. But in small companies, the company grows faster than the people. So the company was going like this, and Depew was going like this, and so he was getting demoted from the top and promoted from the bottom. How did he feel about that? Uh, I think he... I think he had his awkward moments where he didn't understand why he could no longer be head of the bigger entity, but then he noticed he was, his compensation was going up and he was being very successful. So I think we should ask him, but I think he's pretty happy about it. He made a lot of money. How did your role change as uh, somebody else came in to run sales and marketing? Then, I, well, I had a series of jobs. So I went from head of sales and marketing, then briefly I was head of strategy and projects which didn't last long because it wasn't, it wasn't a real job. And then I, then I was given the job of starting the software division and then the workstation division, and I succeeded at those. And then so I was given 
The biggest job in the company was general manager of hardware, including adapters, and that was my biggest job. I was responsible for 70% of revenue and 110% of profits. And then I became candidate for CEO again. This, by then, this is 1990, and Bill Krauss was getting ready to be um, non-executive chairman. The company had sort of, uh, uh, Microsoft had damaged us. We were going sideways. Bill couldn't be CEO anymore. I was running the biggest hardware, the biggest division of the company. So there were three candidates for CEO again. I was one of them. And the board chose Eric Benamou to be CEO. Who had CEO, come from Bridge. Who had come from Bridge. He was the principal asset that we got from Bridge. And then, um, and then um, I retired. The board chose someone else to be CEO twice, separated by 10 years. Uh, both cases, it wasn't me. The second time, I decided to retire amicably. Did you seriously want the job at the time? Did you want to go back to being I CEO? I was a, aspired to be CEO of my own company again. And I, and I think the board, in both cases, when it chose Bill Krauss in 1982, when it chose Eric Bonamou in 1990, certainly, in retrospect, both cases were the right decision because the company blossomed after those two decisions. So I, I'm not complaining. Were you uh, bitter at the time they chose Eric? No. But you left? Yeah, not bitterly. I just, uh, um, I could see why they chose him. He was 10 years younger. He was, um, um, had been succeeding in the software division. He was a good choice. So, I would, no, bitter, bitter would not be the word. Nope. So, disappointed. And then, and then I decided it would be better for me and Eric if I weren't around anymore. Mm -hmm. So then I began a, you know, a, an amicable retirement. I remember they had a big retirement party for me at the new building in 1990, and I went off to become uh, retired and then a journalist. Talk about the acquisition of Bridge the, that got you Eric Benamou, but a whole series of other products as well. Well, the acquisition of Bridge um, was extremely unpleasant, and the source of the unpleasantness came from the word acquisition. If only we had acquired Bridge, things would have been a lot better. Why was it not an acquisition? What was it? We decided, um, Judy Estrin, Bill Carrico, Bill Krauss, and I, that we would merge our two companies. Now, 3Com was about two or three times bigger than Bridge at that time, but we decided we were going to merge. And we liked the idea because we thought we were going to get Bill Carrico to be our chief executive out of it. That was sort of Bill Krause's first attempt to not be CEO of the company. So Bill Carrico became president and Judy became something like CTO. And in other words, we tried to merge the companies rather than acquire them. And that's, that was a big problem. Because suddenly we had two heads of engineering, two heads of Germany, two heads of England, two heads of the U.S., two heads of the Northeast, two heads of the Southeast. And what happened for the next two years is those pairs of people started trying to kill each other. So it was extremely unpleasant. This is, and during that two years is when Cisco took off. And had we done that better, there would be no Cisco and the world would be a better place. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That was just a joke. I was just kidding. <laughs> Everybody at 3Com has now gone to Cisco, so I have to be careful. So I had, um, I was living on uh, what is now called Sand Hill Road in um, Palo Alto. Had an apartment there. Had lived there for a long time, five years or so. And um, I decided that I was going to start a company, so I started meeting with all the venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road. And then when it, just asking them how to start a company. And I got a lot of advice. Reed Dennis was the first VC I ever met with, but then I met with all of the others, Bucknowski and Kramlick and um, Tommy Davis and all the big names were all kind enough to have lunch with me or breakfast or dinner. I gained a lot of weight during that period. And then it came time to move out of my dining room and I opened, uh, we found some sublet space cheap at 3000 Sand Hill Road, which was ground zero of venture capital. And, um, and then uh, decided that we would write a business plan to be ready on September 30th, 1980, when DEC, Intel, and Xerox were about to announce, publish the spec for the Ethernet Blue Book specification that was later to be submitted to the IEEE Project 802 for validation, 
so on. And that story turned ugly, too. So I had my business plan on September 30th, and I went back to all these VCs and um, uh, got some term sheets. But um, my partners and I decided that we wanted top dollar for our stock. So I remember we got a term sheet from um, Mayfield and Venrock and NEA, as I recall. I think that was it. And it was, let's say it was for $13 a share. I think I remember that number. And we decided that we could do better than that. We'd much rather go back to our jobs at Xerox and put up with that kind, kind of money. That would be selling a third of our company for $1.1 million. And we thought that was too low, especially since we already had products that were, we were just beginning to sell. So I went off. I don't want to name names here, but another VC firm promised us, promised us $21 a share. So we went with them. And then over a long period of time, months, it's a month or two, they failed to close because they couldn't find anyone else to join their syndicate. Funny, the whole, everybody but them thought we were worth $13 a share, and they thought we were worth 21 So they started wheeling. And um, they weaseled for too long. And I, let me not spend, oh, it's a whole other story about how they weaseled. And now that I'm a venture capitalist, I can see why they weaseled, but they weaseled. So I called up Jack Melkor, who had been, he, no, he called, his office called me and said, unbeknownst to this whole other process, we've been doing our diligence on your company now for six months, and we'd like to talk to you about making an investment. And here I am with this weaseling VC. So I went over to Jack's office, and I sat in his office, and he said, we'd like to invest at $13 a share at the old number. I said, well, uh, yes, okay, let's do that. Because uh, Jack represented all the major CEOs in Silicon Valley, and Bob Noyce and Ken Oshman and um, John Young, and it went on. He was a very classy guy. So he was doing, he wanted to be the lead investor, so he was going to invest $400,000. But he wanted a couple of other firms to join him, and he asked me if I had any suggestions. So I said, well, one of my constraints is that this Weasling VC not be included. He said, oh, that's odd. Okay, they're a pretty good firm. Yeah, but they've... My relationship with them is broken. I do not want them associated with my company. And, and I said, well, there's Dick Kramlick at NEA, who I like, and then there's um, uh, Wally Davis at uh, Mayfield, who I like, and then there's Venrock. Venrock wants to invest two. And Jack says, well, we could, you have to choose two, because I think this should be a three-way syndicate. So I chose NEA and Mayfield and not Venrock, which is, you know, Venrock came in in the second round. But here I am saying no to Ben Rock for the second time, which is not something you should do. And Jack picked up the phone as I sat there. Dick, Bob, Dick Cranlick, this is, this is Jack Melkor. Bob Metcalf says you'd like, you're interested in the company. Would you like to join my syndicate? Dick said, yes, $13 a share. Yes, I've already made that offer, Dick says. And uh, I'm going to lead at 400 says Jack. And uh, how about are you good for 300 or 250 And Dick says, yes. OK, thanks, Dick. Picks up the phone, calls Wally Davis. Metcalf says you might be interested in investing thirteen dollars a share. How'd you, are you in for three hundred and whatever the number was, three hundred thousand? Wally Davis says yes. Deal done. And then a month later, the money rolled in a million one, like this for a million one. So that's how I um, raised the money. A million one for thirty percent of the company. Thirty-three percent of the company, a million one. Uh, we started the fundraising on September thirtieth, and the money hit the bank on February twenty-first of nineteen eighty-one, and. Um, and then I got Melkor and Kramlick and Davis, three of the top VCs, to be on my board of directors. A year later, we raised a second round with a substantial step up of two or three times. We raised 2.2 million, and that's when Ben Rock and Sequoia came in, uh, two very classy firms. Did the VC stay on your board for a long time? Yes. Um, I remember Pierre Lamont was, was an observer. He later was significant in the founding of Cisco. And, um, uh, Wally Davis left Mayfield, so he was replaced by Gib Myers, who stayed on for quite a long time, and um, Dick Cranley. So w after we went public, they were still on the board. Let's talk about <coughs> Cisco and why it is they developed and why 3Com didn't become what Cisco has become. Well, there's a lot of companies out there that shouldn't exist if, if uh, I knew what I was doing. And Cisco is a prominent example, because 3Com was in um, networking way ahead of Cisco, way ahead of Sandy and her husband at Stanford, Sandy Lerner and Bozak, Len Bozak. Len Bozak. We were in networking way ahead of them, so they really shouldn't 
ever have existed as a company. We, and then later we bought Bridge Communications, which was an actual routing company. And um, so we, sh we three com should, should have been Cisco, actually, but except for me, I just, there was some blindness that I had, I guess. One of my blindnesses, I remember, was I was running market, a lot of marketing at 3Com, and there was a young woman there named Kate Muther who had come in, and she had all sorts of ideas about marketing. I didn't like them, and I drove her out of the company. That's my view of it, stupidly, I might add. And she went directly to be VP of marketing of, Sun Micro, of uh, Cisco and contributed mightily to their, their growth. So there was a mistake right there. Um, and then another mistake is that their router, because it was developed at Stanford, supported, I believe, at one point, 14 different protocols. We supported TCP IP and XNS and um, Apple Talk, as I recall. But they found 14 to support. And that was what succeeded. That is, they, you know, protocols, it, TCP IP hadn't won yet. There was still a big jungle of protocols out there. So they could go into a customer and say, which protocols do you want to use or might you ever want to use ever? We've got 14 of them. And that was appealing because people wanted to future proof. And so they knew they could go in any one of 14 directions or some combination simultaneously. So the iOS, Cisco's Internet Operating System, supported 14 protocols, none of which anyone ever ran other than TCP. But the, having 14 was killer. So that's why I know I'm oversimplifying. Uh, I forgot the fact that they had excellent salespeople and Kate Muther and um, John Chambers. And so they had excellent people, too. That had something to do with it also. But they um, blew past us. And then when we botched the bridge acquisition, you know, we spent two years doing internal political stuff instead of growing the company. That's when they really powered past us and, and became Cisco. If it wasn't for that internal problem in the acquisition of bridge, did bridge have the right product line to be able to compete with Cisco? Arguably. We'll never know for sure, but arguably. That's why we merged with them, or that's why we bought them, depending on how you put it. I mean, in the end of that story, by the way, we had wanted <laughs> I wonder if I should say this. Yeah, I'll tell you this story. It's real interesting. So we acquired or merged with Bridge, and it had two prominent, well, several prominent people, including Eric Benamou, who ultimately became our CEO. But Bill Carrico and Judy Estrin had founded the company and done a great job, and we were happy to have them. And we made Carrico president. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, Prowse's you know, plan was that Carrico would run the company ultimately. And uh, Judy, was, I think she became, I'm a little vague on this, but something like TO or a prominent position. They were married, Judy and Bill. And 3Com had from inception, not well, from slightly after inception, had been very careful about familial relationships among the employees. I think we had some awkward, bad experiences in the early days I don't want to go into. Oh, well, Robin and I did the first 3Com product together, and we decided to stay married, and so uh, instead of she never worked at the company. So we had rules about nepotism and stuff. So we were really careful that Bill and Judy would not be in the chain of command to get there because they were married. And this irritated Judy to no end. She says, look, I'm Judy Esther and he's Bill Carrico. We, I don't want you doing anything special just because we're married. And I'm saying, but you are married. And we're, that's a, you know, complicate things, Judy. I remember having this conversation with her, and she was very offended, and I was very annoyed. And uh, anyway, we arranged for them not to report. Well, eventually, Bill Krause and Bill Carrico discovered that they didn't really get along. And Carrico was a great startup guy, but 3Com was no longer a startup. We were now five times bigger than Bridge had been when he was running it. So he wasn't really great at being the president of this much larger company. So frictions developed. And eventually, Carrico resigned and left. At that time, when Carrico was president, what was uh, Krauss's role? He, uh, I stopped being chairman, and he became chairman chief executive. And I became director, and I was from the hardware division. Okay. So I gave him the, he'd hate for me to say that. I gave him the chairman's job, and he gave Bill the president's job. But then Bill sort of flamed out as president, and Bill, Bill Carrico and, and resigned, and then under pressure, and then Bill went back to being President, Chief Executive. And what was Eric Benamou doing in the meantime? He was running the software division uh, competently. But anyway, the, the, to end this Carrico uh, Etrin story, both, these are both great people. I'm, the same day that Carrico quits, Judy resigns. 
I said, Judy, I thought you just told me that you and Bill were like separate entities and that we shouldn't pay any attention to the fact that you're married. And, and you're leaving on the same day, Judy. What does that tell us? It tells us that you really are married and that it really is, does matter that you're married. Why? We want you to stay. Why are you leaving? Well, I don't know why Bill is being treated and I'm going to. So they went off and founded two or three more successful companies together, which is what they're really good at, running a big company like, like 3Com had become by the time they got there. Talk about uh, Eric Benamou and his accession to power. Do you think that? that well, Eric's an engineer, Eric Benamou. He was, I think he, when, it, when we merged with Braid, I'm a little vague on this, but I believe he became a, you know, was a, a prominent engineering manager. And when I stopped running the software division and went over to do the workstation division, which is another exciting story, uh, he became head of the software division and did a great job of it. Now, I think he may have done the, micro, the ill-fated Microsoft deal, so maybe his record isn't completely... Um, f flawless, but uh, he was very, he is a very good guy. And so when, when the, it became time for um, Bill Krause not to be chief executive, there were three candidates, myself running the, the biggest division of the company, um, Eric Benamou, who was running the software division, and uh, Bob Finocchio, who was running worldwide sales and marketing. And the board chose Eric, and that's when I retired. And did uh, Bob Finocchio stay around, or did he leave? He did, he, and then, uh, yeah, successfully for some time. And then later he became the CEO of Informix. So he, he left. But it was some years later. So he didn't he didn't retire. He didn't take it badly that he wasn't chosen as CEO. But I realized I had to retire at that time. In fact, I should have left several years earlier. Why? I think I come um, counterproductive. I was VP marketing, uh, corporate marketing, in my last year. And... Um, I think in retrospect, when I retired, I realized I probably would have been happier in the company, probably would have been more successful if I left earlier. Something about my mindset that wasn't quite appropriate. Interesting. Talk about the, uh, the workstation business, the three company, and why. Well, um, we had servers, and we uh, had cards, and uh, PCs had sort of been commoditized. And a lot of the, we noticed a lot of the expense and complication of these PCs was the, the floppy disks and the hard disks, the backup and the administration. And so um, we decided we would build a DOS machine or a Windows machine, uh, both, that would be a network computer. And that term later got picked up by Larry Essen and others and made famous. The idea of a PC on the desk, but it was designed to be on the network. So it wouldn't be a standalone machine. It wouldn't have any disks, for example. All the disks would be servers. And, it, and, and I picked up an idea from Steve Jobs and decided that our station shouldn't have a fan either. And so we decided to introduce our own network station that we would sell with our servers and our software and our cards and into enterprises. So we... Um, so I said, I want that job, and they gave me the job. And one year later, we were shipping a, a workstation. It cost $2,000, priced at 2000 list price. We built it for 1000 had no fans in it. It was a cool machine, and I have one upstairs. I really loved it. An odd thing about the design is that the size of the box, which is quite small, it's like a pizza box, sort of, um, was determined entirely by the connectivity. We needed connectivity out the back, you know, the Ethernet adapter and the, we needed two kinds, uh, outboard, inboard, um, the monitor, the keyboard. The back was so small that it was complete, its size was determined by the room for the connectors in the back. And it had no fan and no disc, so it was completely silent, which turned out to be a challenge because people expected their PC to make noises, but it did have a speaker. So we put noises into it. So that when it was um, seeking on a server disk, we made disk noises. And when it was, um, and flashed a little light. Actually, I think it was later, it was a light sufficed. You didn't have to actually make the noise. You just had to show disk activity or the, or the, the what would happen is the user would keep hitting the key trying to make it make noise. And he really, all he needed was a little cue that the thing was actually seeking the disk and you'd be patient for another second or so. And, um, so the first generation of this machine was very successful. We sold hundreds of thousands of them, maybe 100,000, let's say. So from a, it became a big business for 3Com very quickly. This was running Windows or Unix? 
DOS and Windows. DOS and Windows. Do well, Windows was new. Windows came on right around the same time. It was a DOS machine, let's say. And then that's when I learned about micro, uh, dealing with Microsoft because we had to get a DOS license and a Windows license from Microsoft. And it was a horrible experience. Um, and you could see that they had a monopoly and they were leveraging monopoly power and they were extracting huge taxes as a result of this monopoly power. And then you saw when Windows came because you said, they, they demanded that we pay them a royalty for both DOS and Windows for every machine we shipped, whether or not it used DOS or Windows. And that we had to meet a certain quarterly minimum, whether or not we sold any machines at all. And it became clear they were making all their money on minimums. No one was achieving their minimums. They were just pay, we were paying them quarterly minimums for a lot of money for software that weren't, wasn't being used. Presumably these were the same terms they were applying to other manufacturers That's right. as well. They were. Of course, it was harder for us because we were very small. We weren't Compaq or IBM. It was a really abusive situation. That's when I first caught on to the fact that, duh, monopolies can be abusive, uh, which is, you know, we needed DOS, so we didn't have a machine. So we had no negotiating power at all. Uh, oh, and then there were alternatives to DOS, but if we used them, we had to pay Microsoft anyway. They, they negotiated that you had to pay them even if you didn't use their software. So that was, that's where I think they started going uh, anti-competitive. Was there a Unix market for this machine? No, it didn't run Unix. Why not? It was a 286. Couldn't run Unix, very, couldn't run anything very well, actually. DOS. Then we started the second generation of this machine, and that's where we lost it, because the, um, the second system syndrome set in, and we incompetently spent too much money developing a machine that came out too late that was not quite right, and then we killed the division. Actually, I think it was Benamu who killed the division when he took over as CEO. He noticed we, had, we were in too many struggling businesses, and so he closed a few of them. But was it just because the second system was too ambitious? Um, was, was this a good idea, do you think? Were there other people trying to do it? Was I, it well, you this had is sold hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, or maybe 100,000. This is highly debatable, and people who work there don't agree with me about this. But my view is we, that would have been a better. The reason that we ended up closing that business is because we did not execute. And here's, here was the core of it. The first machine was developed by an outside, uh, under contract. The lead developer was an outside contractor named Bernard Danes, who's a very famous man. He's founded several companies since then, including um, Worldwide Packets, I think, is one of his current companies. But anyway, Bernard was a consultant and had been a consultant to 3Com on previous projects. So I got him to be the developer, the, the core developer. He was a chip and board developer to, to do that first board. And then there were 3Com engineers all around him. When we went to do the second machine, the 3Com engineering bureaucracy, my bureaucracy, said, well, it's not healthy that these machines are being developed by an outsider. So we're going to do this one ourselves. And we're going to get rid of Bernard. So we did. But the inside guys were not nearly as good as Bernard. So the machine got poorly specified, poorly it took too long to finish it. When it was finished, it was too expensive because of the difference between Bernard and our internal people. So had I, it was my fault because I let this happen. I was head of this division. I should have said, well, Bernard just performed magnificently on our second, first machine. Duh, why don't we let him do our second machine since that one? And instead, it was this sort of NIH, bring it inside. Why should he have all the fun? We want to design the machine and blah, blah, blah. So we ended up incompetently doing the second machine. But if this was a good idea in an expanding market area, why wouldn't other competitors have done similar products? Well, they were talking about it, and there were things, there were things, I think even Novell talked about a diskless machine, too. So we weren't alone, but we had by far the best machine, the three station, it's called. And it was. Another beauty of this design was we, we realized, being in the cabling business, that cables were a problem. So we designed the machine so that it was raised up about this high and had channels through it. So the keyboard cable and the monitor cable and all the cables were hidden and elegantly through these channels that we had cut in, the, in this uh, box. 
So it was a beautiful little thing, even when the cables were installed. It still looked good. It, you know, the mouse cable came out of a little hole and the keyboard cable. And we had a both right-handed and left-handed channels, depending on whether you were right-handed or left-handed. And so we, we did the, the fan thing right, and we did the cabling thing right, and we did the, the Ethernet thing right. And, and it had great administrative advantages in that you didn't back up your machine. You didn't have to be sure all your disks were back. You didn't have any more disks. You didn't have that little box of floppy disks anymore that everyone used to have in those days because everything was on the server, which is sort of um, how it should be. Is, was this still a disk sharing system or was it file sharing? What was the interaction between three systems? It ran both NetWare and um, our network operating system. Mm -hmm. And so it was both, and our disk sharing software by this time had become file sharing, Belate, too late to uh, unseat Novell. But. So you'd just turn on the machine, it would boot up over the network, and you'd have a DOS machine there, and you could run applications, and it was administered centrally. And what was the performance like? It was um, in some ways better than the PC because we put a lot of memory on it, and we had RAM disk. So there was no disk disk, but there was a RAM disk in the machine. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of applications, it was just faster because it would just access a RAM disk instead of going all the way to the, or a hard disk on the server instead of a floppy on the desktop. So it would get much better performance by going to a shared hard disk than the local floppy. So there was no, there was no more floppy. So a lot of people would whine, oh, we always, we want a floppy. We want floppy disks. Remember they used to complain the Macintosh didn't have floppy disks either. Well, floppy disks were a thing of the past. In fact, they are a thing of the past, actually. <laughs> And we were just among the first companies to sell them. I remember at the, um, in the shop at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, for years afterwards, I would go there, and there were the three stations in the shop running the cash register. For years, at, you, know, you know how um, private institutions like that don't have a lot of money, so when someone donates equipment, it just stays there forever. So I, I used to sometimes go out of my way to go to the Exploratorium just so I could visit the three stations in the shop there. I guess eventually they replaced them. The notion of how much computation is in front of the person versus how much is remote is a pendulum that swung back and forth many times. In some sense, the three station is a move back toward time sharing or external type interaction where the user interface is in front of the user and the rest of the processing, or some of it at least, is, is centralized. Well, be careful there. The, the swing back wasn't as extreme as you just portrayed it. The Windows and DOS and Word and uh, still ran on your desktop. It was just the back-end data functions that were. So yes, it was a slight swing back, but it's not as extreme. We were still using the microcontrol microprocessor on the desktop to do that uh, high interactivity that that is the advantage. Do you think that this didn't succeed as a computational model because disks got so dense and so cheap so quickly? Well, I think it has succeeded as a computational model by degrees. That is, PCs and corporations now to a large extent rely on servers, that is, people, and the backs up, backups are automatic. Now, they do have local disks, I suppose. But we had local disks too. Ours were made of RAM. Theirs were made. The modern ones were made of multi-gigabyte disks. So it's hard to say. But you're right. It's a, it is a pendulum. But on in a way, it's it's many pendulums. You know, the disk storage swings back. The processing swings back and forth. You know, you have compute servers. How much of the stuff you do on your machine now is done on the internet? Which is you know, like Google isn't even done in your building anymore. It's just a, you have a little Windows interface and you're using Google all day. So, I mean, a lot of the applications are starting now to run. Amazon on the is an application that does not run in your building, um, and on it goes. So, yeah, there's lots of little pendulums swinging back and forth. Before we leave uh, 3Com and go on to the next phase, uh, can you talk a bit more about some of the other Ethernet competitors that have managed to continue on? Uh, storage area networks tend to use fiber channel. Um, why, why didn't this all conver converge in the interests of compatibility to Ethernet? That's funny. The way you asked that question is the, op the opposite premise from the one I have in my head. Ethernet has over its 34 years, killed a long series of competitors. 
and it's busily killing Fiber Channel and Infiniband right now, and Sonnet is doomed. So the, the, the wars continue, and Ethernet continues winning. Now, well, what happened to FDDI? And what happened to Token Ring? And what happened to ArcNet? And what happened, what are some uh, ATM? What happened to ATM? They're all being killed by Ethernet. Why do people keep trying? Well, it's this pendulum thing. You, you uh, well, there's also subtlety beneath this. There's the pendulum thing. You keep saying, well, well, Ethernet's good for that, but we have to do this. And this is very specialized, and you know, like fiber channel for storage. Uh, so we're going to, and there are lots of, there's FireWire and USB, and some of which are quite important because they're so specialized, Ethernet specialized. Uh, one of the reasons that Ethernet has been persisting for 34 years is this funny thing has evolved where when a new technology comes along, they call it Ethernet. So it isn't as if the thing that Dave Boggs and I you know, built in 1973 has been winning for 34 years. It's just that every time something wins, they call it Ethernet. Uh, so the things that are called Ethernet today are quite different and diverse. But Fiber Channel and Finiband are doomed, and Sonnet is doomed, T1 is doomed. But of course, when something's doomed, it takes a real, especially if it's a networking technology, it takes a really long time to die. What about USB? Well, I, it's great. I use it all the time. So there, is, there are reasons for diversity of standards. There's considerable diversity within Ethernet. But then there's, I mean, the generations of Ethernet coexist. In fact, my Mac has a single plug, and it decides whether it's 10, 100, or a gigabit per second. It's a miracle to me. Uh, just depending on what switch I have, it just decides what, it's, uh, what, what geniuses came up with that. So there's variety as technological advance disrupts the standard, but then there's variety because of different uses, and USB is a great example for what USB does, that particular physical interconnect is superior to the RJ45 that we use in, predominantly in Ethernet. Um, it can't just be the physical interconnect, though, because Ethernet could adapt to have an alternate physical connector if that was the issue. Exactly, and it's conceivable they could have called USB Ethernet, but they didn't. They happened to call it. Well, Wi-Fi was originally called wireless Ethernet, so now they call it Wi-Fi. So that's, an, that's a case where the, the brand name has been, the Ethernet brand name has been shunted aside, and they, it is wireless Ethernet. You look at the packet formats, it's very close to the 802 packet format. But they've decided now, so that's a departure, that's a blow. That means Ethernet is maybe peaking now as a name. And um, so here's wireless Ethernet becomes Wi-Fi. Hmm, that's interesting. Is so yes, one, uh, one could imagine building an RJ45 with a little um, flash memory attached to it that you just plug into an Ethernet adapter and it does exactly what a USB. And is, I don't know why. There's probably some simplifying circuitry, some optimization, or just an accident of history. I'll have to remote, suggest to the USB people that they call it Ethernet something, uh, plug, pluggable Ethernet, flash Ethernet, Ethernet fl Ether flash. call it Ether flash. Yeah. Is the Ethernet name trademarked? Does somebody own it, or is there somebody responsible for its use? I am responsible for its use. So in 1973, on May 22nd, in a memo that I wrote at the Xerox Palo Alto Research, I coined the word Ethernet. It used to have be two words with a capital N, and then it became one word with a capital N, and then we dropped the capital N, and now it's capital E, small n. It was a Xerox trademark, uh, briefly, and then when we brought Ethernet to the IEEE, the IEEE DEC, and when we formed the DIX consortium, Intel and DEC said, we're happy to join with you in this uh, consortium, um, but we can't use the name that you've chosen. Xerox thought Ethernet was kind of a nerdy name, so they had changed its name to the Xerox Wire. The Xerox Wire, great name. DEC and Intel said, we'd love to work with you on it, but we're not going to call it the Xerox Wire. Why don't we call it Ethernet? So then they went to the IEEE. The IEEE said, well, we can't. We're going to call it 802.3. Uh, we really don't want to use the word Ethernet because that's a, th that's a trademark of Xerox Corporation. So then Xerox decided to let go of the trademark. 
So it's really an uncontrolled word. So who's in charge of that word now? Has to be me. I can't think of anyone better. So I'm in charge. And this came up. HP introduced 100 megabit per second technology in the 90s that they tried to call fast Ethernet. And I noticed that it was sufficiently different from Ethernet in its operations that I didn't think it should be called Ethernet. And I was then a journalist, so I wrote a column in InfoWorld attacking HP for trying to use the word Ethernet for this kludge. And a big fight ensued, and, and then eventually they had to change the name. And they changed it to 100 VG AnyLAN. Was it? Became its new marketing name. Have you heard of? Have you bought any recently? Of 100 VG AnyLAN? No, I'm sorry. It's called Fast Ethernet. Runs at 100 megabits per second, and, and now, of course, it's passe because we've moved on to gigabit Ethernet, GE gigabit Ethernet. You left 3Com in 1990. Did you have any continued involvement with the company after that? Yes, it, it was pretty normal. But when I left, I, when I retired, I remained a consultant for another year, a consultant, paid consultant to the company. And during which time, I went to England as a visiting fellow at the, at the University of Cambridge in England. And that was my first attempt at retirement. And that didn't last, so I came back to be publisher of InfoWorld. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But after that year, after you left, you had no further involvement in the company. Do you have any observations on what happened to it after that? And um... Um, So when I left, the company was around a half a billion a year in revenue. And uh, next thing I knew, it had five billion a year in revenue. And, uh, and people began to tell me that I was the inventor of the palm. <laughs> people would show me their palm, and it had 3Com written on it. And they knew I had founded 3Com, so they assumed, a lot of people assumed that I had invented the palm. And the hilarity of that was extreme. First of all, I wasn't at 3Com when 3Com bought US Robotics or merged with US Robotics, a horrible mistake. No one knew that when 3Com did that, they had no idea that Palm was part of US Robotics, that it was just buried in some division somewhere, and that they had acquired it accidentally. And then no one knew that 3Com had sort of botched the care and feeding of Palm so that its founders had to leave and start a whole new company. They just naturally assumed that since 3Com was written on the Palm, that I had invented it. And of course, I w was not quick to deny it. <laughs> <laughs> Why was the acquisition of U.S. Robotics a mistake? Because U.S. Robotics was a fraud and uh, had been stuffing its channel and had outmoded products that no one wanted to buy, and uh, 3Com stupidly bought it. The mistake was slightly more conceptual. Eric Benamou, after he took over as CEO, did a series of acquisitions, all of which were successful. Prominently so, and a big break from the series of unsuccessful acquisitions 3Com had done prior to his becoming CEO. And the reason is he had learned from the unfortunate bridge experience where he watched 3Com and bridge try to merge. So he adopted the principle explicitly that 3Com was never going to merge with anybody. It was going to acquire much smaller companies. And that was a formula that worked. We are buying you. We're big, you're small, we're buying you, and you're, no, you're not the president anymore, and you're not the head of Germany anymore. We already have one of those. And they would just efficient, you know, on the first day, let everyone know what was going to happen instead of futzing around for two years figuring it out. U.S. Robotics and 3Com were about the same size when he decided to merge the two companies. That was his mistake. So he, these two $2.5 billion companies, roughly, merged. So that was the conceptual error. He broke his own rule after a string of great successes. And plus, US Robotics was, I hate to say it, but a fraud. I mean, it was just modems were going like this, and they had been grossly stuffing the channel. So there was this big uh, Magilla followed right after the merger where they discovered that a lot of the sales were fake. So why do you think Eric did that? Did he not know um, US Robotics? sufficiently well at the time of the merger? I wasn't there, and I don't really know what happened, so I'm really making stuff up here. But I, I, he just got snookered. Happens all the time. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think that was uh, a cause of what's happened to 3Com in, uh, since then? How, how do you rate 3Com in, in the years since? I have very little knowledge of 3Com uh, since I left in 1990. I did notice that it grew to $5 billion, which is a lot bigger than when I was there. So the board of directors had made the decision again of CEO correctly. Eric did great. Uh, the bridge merger is what caused Cisco to exist, and, and, and I guess the ro U.S. robotics sort of broke the back of the momentum that 3Com had going into the bubble. So that's why Cisco's even bigger and 3Com is now less than, I guess, revenues must be below a billion now, probably three quarters of a billion. And they had to give them Palm. Well, there was this funny period in which Palm, which 3Com owned, which 3Com owned, about 95 percent of, or if not all of it, and the market cap of Palm was bigger by far than the market cap of 3Com, which was weird. I kept asking people, how can that be? You know, what sort of Wall Street math allows that to be true? No one has ever adequately explained that to me. But I guess then they spun off Palm and gave their shareholders a great benefit at that. So part of the shrinkage had to do with spinning Palm off, and part of it had to do with just uh, when the bubble burst, a lot of companies went down. 3Com went down with them. Uh, and some of it had to do with the company having lost its way somewhere along the line. Now, the new CEO, Edgar Masri, he and I worked together at 3Com. And then he went off to become a venture capitalist in my same building here in Waltham. And then he's gone back now to take the challenge of um, making the most of 3Com which is now an East Coast company. Well, that's another irony. When I founded 3Com on the phone from an apartment I had on Beacon Hill, not far from here, founded it as a California company because I was also living in Palo Alto. I had an apartment in Palo Alto, one here. So for years afterwards, whenever I was in Massachusetts, I would tell people from Massachusetts that 3Com had been founded in Massachusetts. And then when I was back in California, which is most of the time, I would tell people it was founded in Palo Alto, both of which were actually true. and the Headquarters was um, moved around from Palo Alto to Menlo Park to Mountain View to Santa Clara, I guess Santa Clara, and then it moved to Marlboro, Massachusetts. So now 3Com, th people think 3Com was founded in Massachusetts and has already always been here, which is not true. I mean, it's always been here a little, but now it's headquartered here in, um, in Marlboro. I think it's still Marlboro. So that's a bit of iron irony. But I, I don't know anything about 3Com. I, I mean, I, my contact has been very distant for, for um, I've been gone longer from 3Com than I was there. So it's really quite a remote. So every time something bad happens at 3Com, I'm not there anymore. And every time something good happens there is I founded the company. You once said that your life so far had four careers as an engineer, entrepreneur, pundit, and VC. Let's uh, move into the pundit phase. After you left 3Com, you were a consultant for a while. Um, why didn't you start more companies? Other people have become serial entrepreneurs, and you didn't. Right. And I considered it. Um, in fact, really did start a, f a couple more companies, but only as a, from a distance. So for example, Grand Banks, Grand Junction Networks, um, which is the company that introduced fast Ethernet. I was a founding director of it and worked with Howard. Convinced, really, I convinced, I, I don't know, I'll probably annoy the people associated with it, but I convinced Howard Charney to start that company. In fact, Howard came to me and said, Bob, let's start a company like we did 3Com. Howard Charney, if you're going to ever do anything in life, if you can get Howard Charney to do it with you, and he came to me and said, let's start a company. I said, no, I'm not going to start a company. And let me get around to answering why not. But I said to Howard, why don't you start the company? And he said, well, no, you know, you're the, you talk to talk and walk to walk and have the network. I'm the engineering guy and the manufacturing guy. You should really start the company. I said, Howard, you can do it. And he did. He started Grand Junction Networks and sold it to Cisco for two, three, four hundred million dollars. And that was fast Ethernet, and I was a founding investor there and was in you know, the early dinette table discussions of what to do, but ultimately did not want to start a company because I burned out at 3Com. 
that is, I, in those 13 years worked out very well, but they were hard, and especially the last part, and I didn't want to do it again. And I felt I could sort of stay in the same community and just take a different role. The beauty of my career at 3Com is I got to do a lot of different things. I got to run divisions, I got to run sales, I got to run marketing, I got to do PR, I got to do advertising, I got to do engineering design, I got to write programs. I wrote programs for money at 3Com briefly. It didn't last very long, but I did. I wrote a uh, Epson printer emulator in PostScript, and, and we sold it to Xerox uh, for money. And I wrote it myself, and then we decided that was not a good use of my talents and that I should go run marketing instead or something. So I had a variety. So maybe it's a variety thing that as I did that already, now I want to do something else. So I went into journalism for 10 years. I was a journalist, publisher, journalist for 10 years, and then uh, for the last six years I've been a venture capitalist. Had you any previous writing experience? Why did you think you could be a journalist? Well, one of the things that appealed to me about journalism is that if I were a journalist, I wouldn't have to do performance appraisals anymore. <laughs> starting at about 1970, I believe vividly, June of 76, I did my, started, doing, started having people reporting to me at Xerox. And I had to start doing performance appraisals because they're very important and they need to be done well. I just never liked doing them. And I've done a lot of them and I still do them. But being a journalist, you're an individual contributor and you don't do performance appraisals. And I really like that part. Why is doing a performance appraisal so painful? It's important. It must be done. So it's not as if I have the option of not doing performance appraisals because that's there are people who adopt that option and they're being irresponsible and ineffective. Um, well, I don't like it because I do performance appraisals every day. That is, I prefer to, when I talk with people, to tell them how they stand and what they're doing and how to improve every minute of every conversation. So stopping to do it in writing on an annual or semi-annual basis seems um, ex redundant and, um, and, re and reducing it to writing and then having the, what is often a difficult discussion. I'd much rather have it a little bit every day than all at once every year. That's, I guess, so by the time I'm done with you, you know exactly what your performance is, in my opinion, and you don't need me to write it down. But then I do write it down, and then we have it out again. And I don't like that part. Okay. So what was what were your step in, steps in becoming a journalist? So um, it happened sort of by accident. I do like to write, and, and I believe part of my success package is writing. The memos I wrote at Xerox, the design, the Ethernet memo that I wrote in 1976 is a nice piece of writing. I'm really proud of it. And I spent, I must have spent two years writing it. Xerox wouldn't let me publish it. This Ethernet memo uh, became a CACM paper in July of 76. Uh, I really had to write it for a really long time uh, because they wouldn't let me publish it. So I kept iterating it and it's a pretty good piece of writing. So I, I sort of admire writing and writers. Oh, my first exposure was at MIT. Uh, my advisor for a while was J.W. Forrester, the inventor of uh, core memory and builder of the whirlwind computer and so on. He was my advisor. Uh, there were 12 of us. He advised a group of 12 of us, the undergraduate systems program in the Sloan School of Management. I was one of 12, and he was our advisor. And one day, Jay says, by the way, I'm going to run a writing seminar if you guys are interested. So I'd like you to come to my office every Friday, and we're going to learn how to write together. The inventor of core memory wants to teach me how to write. So we went to his, a group of us, not all 12 of us, went to his office, and and he gave us our first writing assignment. I forget what it was, ironically. Write an essay about something. So we all went off, came back the next Friday with our essays, and he had a, we read them to each other and commented on them. And, and then he said, OK, I'd like you to uh, write it again, same topic. And my recollection is he asked us to write 19 times the same essay. So did I learn to write from Jay Forrester? No. What I learned from Jay Forrester is that Jay Forrester th thinks that writing is important. So then I thought writing was important, and so then I began writing a lot. So my business plans and my sales presentations and my corporate memos were all written 
more so than your average engineer or salesperson. So I like to encourage salespeople and engineers to write because it leverages them. You know, once you write something, it has much more power than if you just blab it, which is... Before coming, becoming a journalist, officially, had you written articles for trade journals or uh, newspapers? I've given a lot of speeches, a lot of which were written. And I'd written, uh, I had written papers as, uh, you know, academic papers, uh, oh, not many, but a, a series of them. I remember writing my PhD dissertation was very hard, so writing does not come easy to me. And you had written RFCs. I had written RFCs, and I enjoyed writing them, and they, um, that's right, thank you for reminding me of that. I had written, yeah, I've always liked writing as a way of getting leverage, because you, you say it once and then it gets read a bunch of times in places you didn't expect, so yeah. The power of writing as a leverage tool, and writing and speaking, I would say. Writing, speaking, presenting as a way of leveraging, selling what you're doing. <clears throat> so when I retired from 3Com, I was invited to be a visiting fellow at Cambridge University. And I was also um, invited to write pieces about Ethernet, uh, journalistic pieces in trade publications generally. And as I was going to Cambridge, I, the editor of Communications Week, a weekly trade rag, and I, he said, I'd like you to write a weekly column for me. And I said, well, I'm going to Cambridge, England. So we decided that I would write about what was happening in Cambridge, England, in the computer laboratory there. So I started writing a weekly column, and that was my transition from freelance to um, staff. I, you know, I had a regular weekly deadline, and then I really liked that. I liked it because I was generally my method was to keep ten columns in progress at all times, up in the air, working on them, and then my deadline would approach, and I would choose one of them and write it. And then I noticed that the people around me, grad students at the computer laboratory, suddenly wanted to be with me, because they wanted me to write about them, so that they all became little flax and I became the hack and so I, I, I noticed I had access to people who would talk to me about what they were doing because they wanted me to write about them and that gave me a way to learn about what they were doing. So it was a very useful tool for satiating my curiosity about things. If I get curious about something I just take it up as a column project and, and then I learn about it. So then I, then I got after that I did that for about a year, and then Pat McGovern, who runs IDG, the National Data Group, publishes 300 magazines around the world, invited me to be publisher CEO of InfoWorld, which was a, at that time a 40 or $50 million publication, one of the top ones in the world. And so I said, wow, I could start at the top CEO of a big publishing company. But is that a writing gig, or is it a management job? That's a management and selling job, selling advertising. So for uh, three years, I was two and a half or three years, I forget, something like that, I was publisher CEO, and I learned how to sell advertising, and I sold hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising, which is an incredible world that I loved learning about, how to, how to, how to build a, an audience of readers and how to sell them to advertisers. You know, that whole business, it's a huge business, and it's very subtle, it's even more complicated than high-speed network interfaces. And so I learned how to sell advertising. It was great. But then the editor-in-chief, Stuart Alsop, um, invited me to write a publisher's column. Publisher's column is a very standard thing, and you generally don't read them. So I started writing a publisher's column. But I had been writing this column at Communications Week, which I had to stop because I now had a new job. So I, st I started writing a column that wasn't quite a publisher's column. And, I, and one day, this wonderful thing happened. Stuart Alsop came into my office and said, Bob, I want to remove the word publisher from your byline. I'd like it just to be your column from the ether with your byline. It won't be a publisher's column. It'll just be a column. And that was a promotion, right? Because the publisher's column is kind of perfunctory rubbish, generally. So then I became a columnist. But then the following, so this took a year, a couple of years. The problem was that as, as a columnist, 
I love to opinionate and be nasty. Tell the truth to my readers. Be interesting. And that sometimes involved attacking vendors of equipment to whom, with my other hat, I was selling advertising and marketing programs to. So eventually that became untenable. Too many, too many of my customers said, you can't write that about me and sell me ads at the same time. You're not allowed to do that. Your magazine can do it, but you can't do it. So that's when I moved to Boston, stopped being publisher of InfoWorld and became IDG's vice president of technology, which meant pundit, uh, sort of a corporate level pundit writing for InfoWorld and organizing conferences. And, and um, working with Computer World, and there we sold you know a billion dollars of advertising every year. Do you find that satisfying? As satisfying as creating companies and products? It was a, I did it for ten years. Uh, loved every minute of it. Not every minute of it. Never love every minute of everything, but it was great. So then I took my best columns and I published a book. IDG published my book, uh, Internet Collapses and Other InfoWorld um, Punditry. It's still available on Amazon.com. You can buy it used for under $2. And uh, had an illustrious career as a pundit. I predicted the collapse of the Internet. I predicted the bursting of the Internet bubble, 50 or so. I was half right. Um, Let's talk about some of your predictions. One of them has become famous as, as Metcalf's Law. And I don't know when it first um, became published. I know that uh, George Gilder talked about it in a Forbes article in 1993. Was that, what is it, and, and when did it first appear? Metcalf's Law. Well, I like the fact that it's called Metcalf's Law. And often they talk about Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law. And I love when they do that, because being associated with Gordon Moore and his law is just really social climbing for me. Uh, in 1982, 81, in the early 80s, um, I was selling Ethernet. And um, uh, so it went like this. So we developed the Etherlink for PCs. So we have a sales force, now 12 people, and we're a tiny little company. So we made a rule. We can't call on people who don't already have PCs because it's IBM's job to convince them to buy PCs. It's our job to convince them to use Etherlinks to network them. Let's not evangelize PCs. Two is don't call on anyone who has Apple IIs. We'll let Nestar do that. And our Ethernet is too powerful for the pitiful Apple II. And we'll just focus on IBM PCs, a very wise business decision. And third, all of our salespeople used to sell uh, mini computers. And they cost about $30,000. So we're going to try to sell 30 node networks so that we'll get $30,000 per sale. And then we'll all get the right amount of commission. And then we can send our children to college. Well, we learned that the first two qualifiers worked. That is, it was really shrewd to not be evangelizing PCs, because IBM was doing that. And it was really shrewd to not be doing Apple IIs, because that would have divided our engineering and support efforts. And, and we let Nestar have that business. Uh, but the $30,000 thing was a problem, because lands were generally unknown. And um, printer sharing and disk sharing were interesting, but $30,000 to try something I never heard of? So that wasn't, and our sales cycle was infinite, and we weren't getting any business. So we decided it was in an offsite in Lake Tahoe. We rented a house, we had an offsite there, and one of the revelations of this offsite is we were going to sell three node trial networks. So we put together the promotional materials, and we told our salespeople, no more $30,000 networks. Don't do that anymore. Stop. We're going to sell trials, three node networks. And I know your commission on that's pitiful, but there'll be follow-on business, and that's where you'll make your real money. I decided that. As head of sales, I enforced it on our sales force, and it worked. So we sold. Suddenly, our sales cycle collapsed to one week, because people could spend $3,000 a lot easier than $30,000, and they did. And the idea of printer sharing and disk sharing was enough to sell a 3,000 trial. And our, net, our products worked, which was a plus. But our customers said, yeah, your products work just like you said, but they're not very useful. Well, that's devastating. Why aren't they useful? Well, the answer is a three-node network can't be useful. 
it's too small. Hmm, why is that? So I drew a graph, and the graph had number of nodes on the network along the bottom and dollars vertical. And the cost of the network was a straight line. It went up $1,000 per node like this. But what's the value of the network? Well, the value of the network must have something to do with the number of nodes that you can connect to from your PC. N. And then each node has that value. That is, it can talk to n other no n minus one other nodes, and there's n of those. So the total value of the whole network is n times n minus one, which is approximately n squared, and that becomes a quadratic line. It goes like this, and there's this point out there where the linear and the quadratic cross. And so for small n, the value is below the cost, and then there's a critical mass point. And then above that, the value greatly exceeds the cost and gets better all the time, network effect. So then I made the slide, um, gave it to the sales force, and told the story. The reason that your three node networks are not as useful as you like is that they're below critical mass. And the way that you begin to experience value is to buy more of them from me. So, I'm not exactly sure where the critical mass point is, but I'm pretty sure it's above three. So let's do that. So we went back to our customers who were, the products work, it's just they're not very useful. We gave them a reason why they weren't useful. You have not achieved critical mass. That reason seemed plausible. Wouldn't you know we started selling $30,000 networks to these people. They believe that story. And thank God, the story turned out to be true. That is, when they bought the 30-node networks, they were useful. They accessed the internet with them, which was a new capability, accessed frame. They, and the, oh yeah, the LAN email was much more useful when you could include a whole group instead of just three. The LAN email was kind of a product no one was interested in, but they got interested in it once they were started using it. It was a, no one ever imagined that you'd want to send email to somebody down the hall. But then as soon as they did it, they began to enjoy the benefit of it, and it caught on, and it became much more valuable at 30 than it was at 3. So that was a slide. And then in 1993, this is 13 years later, or 10 years later, George Gilder started working on a book that ultimately was named Telecosm. It was a follow-on to his earlier book called Microcosm, out of which the book Microcosm, I believe, is the book in which Moore's Law was touted, came of age, escaped intel. George was working on Telecosm, and he interviewed me, and he asked me for a bunch of stuff, and I showed him my you know, artifacts, and he saw this slide showing the straight line and the quadratic with the critical mass point, and he said, that's Metcalf's law, and he wrote this uh, article in Forbes ASAP in 1973 referring to Metcalf's law, the value of a network grows as the square of the number of attached users, devices, whatever. Then, so that's 93. So it's, so Metcalf's law gets some usage thanks, and then his book came out in 95, which gave it another little boost in people's consciousness. And then um, Al Gore, started promoting the information superhighway. So Al Gore, let's not get into this, but Al Gore and I may not have invented the internet, but we invented the internet bubble. And Al Gore started talking about the information superhighway, and then in 1995 or six, he shows up at the MIT commencement, and I'm sitting, I'm a trustee of MIT, I'm sitting on the stage, and he starts talking about Metcalf's Law. And then two years later, Bill Clinton shows up at MIT commencement, and he starts talking about Metcalf's Law. So Metcalf's Law became one of the inflators of the internet bubble, like the information superhighway metaphor. The, the notion of this value creation by connecting things together became part of the internet bubble inflator. So then, all these business plans got written referring to Metcalf's Law and why you should invest in this company. And the bubble blossomed, and you know what happened. And then it burst. Well, Metcalf's Law is still out there. So now there's a new bubble inflating. I'm not exactly sure what it is, the social networking bubble or so on. But Metcalf's Law has become, has a, begun appearing on PowerPoints again. 
So an article was written in the IEEE Spectrum a few months ago in which three professors ganged up on me and they wrote an article, cover story, I guess, on Spectrum about Metcalfe's Law. Not only did they claim for the 19th, 20th time that Metcalfe's Law is wrong, they actually wrote that Metcalfe's Law is dangerous. They used the word dangerous because it's helping to inflate the social networking um, bubble. I've written a, a rebuttal to their article, which you can find on the internet by blogging, but um, it's a blog entry. But basically, in that, I point out that these guys, after attacking my law and calling it dangerous, the only improvement that they suggest was that the value of a network doesn't grow as the square of the number of users, it grows as n log n, which is, you know, n log n is approximately n times n, uh, you know, in my, th that is, they never, really got to the bottom of it. They just, they're, you know, refining a thing that's just conceptual to begin with. And the proof of this is, of course, that no one has ever tried to assess the constants of proportionality in the law. No one has ever actually taken my law and tried to apply it to actual numbers like they do to Moore's law. You know, Moore has data points that his curve sort of fits. No one has ever, including me, has ever tried to put data against the law. And these three professors, they didn't do it either. They just conceptually argued that n log n was better than n squared. whoop de doo And there's someone else, David Reed, who claims that it's two to the n, not. Yeah, well, yeah, David Reed, who I know and admire, has Reed's law, and, and uh, I always, rib him about it because no one's ever heard of Reed's law. <laughs> I mean, very few people have heard of Metcalfe's law, but no one has ever heard of Reed's law, and I like to rib him about it, whether 2n or n log n, is, they're all missing the point. The whole point is networking is valuable. That's the point. And yeah, but in comparing it to something like Moore's law, where in fact you can plot specific numbers against a chart, uh, what, what's the metric for value that allows you to represent it as mathematically as you did on that chart? Well, the flaw is even deeper than that. There's no real notion of connectivity. So you really need to know the va uh, what it costs. My, my, um, uh, quantification of connectivity was the cost of the network and then the value I never really defined what the value is so the quantification is impossible well I'm working on that I'm actually trying to um, uh, take another look at the law and try to quantify try to do a Moore's law kind of thing with some real data and you know and try to assess what the constants of proportionality is and see if the law is actually true or not you know who knows it, probably not exactly true. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that it must peak out at some point and roll over. That is, there's six billion people on Earth. Do you have anything to say to the last five billion? Probably not, so maybe it. On the other hand, as I wrote in my blog response to this attack in IEEE Spectrum, Metcalfe's law recurses. That is, there's a, there's a value of being on the internet, but then there's a value of being in the little networks that form on top of the internet, like social networks or uh, the, the networks that f form around books from Amazon, that's a, that's a network there. And then blogs are a network, too. So there's a recursion, I argue, a recursion of Metcalfe's Law at the higher level networks like this. And that if you integrate the total value of the base level plus all the recursions, it's n squared again, even though there's a roll off on the the base level value. And it's sort of like a fractal curve. Every time you look in microcosm, it uh, it's, appears like the whole. It's fractal. <laughs> I, I, I regret now that I didn't include the word fractal in the title of that post. The post was, Metcalfe's law recurses down the long tail of social networking. And I should have said, recurses fractally down the long tail of, of um, social networking. I should have said that. I, thanks for that. I'm going to use it in the future. Well, Metcalfe's Law has been a wonderful um, catalyst for lots of discussion about the value of networking. So in that sense, it's extremely useful, regardless of how specific it is. And just for the record, I wrote a column about Metcalfe's Law a long time ago in which I made it clear that it's a conceptual thing, that I don't really think it's that serious a mathematical thing, that Moore's Law really is a different kind of thing that has a life in actual data as opposed to concept, and you know all this disclaimer. But then every week, some idiot out there discovers Metcalfe's Law and attacks me because he thinks that I think it's exactly correct and that I take it all that seriously. And then I have to refer him 
this poor schmuck back to <laughs> back to my column that I wrote ten years ago, agreeing with him. You know, but you know, that's the wonder of the internet. So let's talk about seriousness with respect to uh, uh, predictions. You you made one in December of 1995 that had to do with the collapse of the internet. What well, what was the prediction, and, and were you serious? It was a brilliant success, actually. That prediction. The uh, I was a columnist at the time with about a million readers, uh, if you count international and pass along the assessment. Uh, actually, in the U.S., my readership was assessed by third parties at 629,000, but so I'll say a million for round numbers. So when I wrote my column every Sunday night, I wrote 615 words that I knew very shortly were going to be read by a million people. So I, I love that power. Every little word, I said, this word of the and is going to be read by a million people in a few days. Oh, should it be there? Should I delete it? I like to delete articles, by the way. And uh, they seem like busy words to me. And then, so it was a real lovely, powerful thing. And, but I wanted to succeed as a columnist. I wanted that million to be two million someday. Um, and the raise, that raises certain ethical questions. Uh, about the extent, and I believe many columnists make the wrong decisions ethically at this point, because there's a difference between being interesting and being right. And you kind of owe it to your readers to be interesting, um, to be right, but you won't have any readers unless you're interesting. So it's a, uh, anyway, I, at that time I was uh, learning to be interesting, because I wanted to get to two million readers from one million. And I saw a number of problems with the internet in 95, um, all of which were true insights. The fragility of the thing, the fact that Cisco routers could all be crashed at the same time, the fact that there were only 12 name servers, the fact that spam was taken off, the fact that no one had anticipated viruses and security, the fact that packet loss was going up and up and up because the traffic was exceeding certain circuits in certain places. And I accumulated a long list of all these reasons which spelled doom for the internet. And um, so one night, you know, <laughs> writing the column, I decided how to phrase this. So I s predicted, and, and I had to write a column every week, you understand, and prediction, I began to learn that my readers appreciated predictions because they kind of relied on me to help them assess the future and so on. So I, how could I make this into a prediction that would be interesting? And so I predicted the collapse of the internet, I chose that word carefully, the collapse of the internet during 1996. And I gave, and it was a bunch of columns, and they're all in my book, by the way. My book's titled Internet Collapses and Other Infoworld Punditry, available at Amazon.com. Um, on the long tail, it used to have a two-digit Amazon rank, and now it has a seven-digit Amazon rank, I'm proud to say, uh, last time I checked. Um, and I check often. Um, the, um, but then I quantified this. I said that during 1996, there would be an outage of the internet which exceeded one billion lost user hours. I called it a gigalapse. And I predicted there would be a gigalapse in 1996. And that's what I meant. And then I wrote a number of spoofy articles. I predicted that pornography would bring down the internet. Not the actual pornography, it was all the writing about the pornography would clog the internet. There wasn't really much pornography at all, I claimed briefly. I mean, a lot of tongue in cheek and sarcasm. My editors always said, don't be sarcastic, they'll rub your nose in it. I ignored that advice and wrote a lot of stuff. And uh, during 1996, there were some pretty big outages. The biggest one occurred in August of that year, and it was, forget the exact number, a 118 megalapse, about one-eighth of a gigalapse. And that's as close as I got. How do you measure a lost <clears throat> user hour? Uh, how many users were denied access to the internet for how long? You multiply the number of hours times the number of users. And uh, this particular outage was a bunch of Cisco routers at AOL came down. And the funny thing was, and I was right about it, I wrote about this, there was no genetic diversity. They were all Cisco routers. 
So the, the, um, the bug in the one router was in all of the routers, right? And, and so the router went down. And so they reloaded it, but by the time they reloaded it, the bu this one had gone down. It had somehow rebooted itself, and so they went to fix that one. And these two had gone down. They spent a whole day, 19 hours actually, uh, trying to bring these routers back up, but they kept bringing each other down faster than they could bring them up. But eventually they got it under control. But before they had done that, a 118 megalapse had occurred. And I, trumpeted this in my column, of course, because it meant that, hey, it was only August. We still had September, October, November, and December. It could happen. But the year came and went, and that was the biggest outage of the year. Well, this, by the way, these columns generated all sorts of interest and activity. A lot of stuff got written. A lot of all the internet intelligentsia were on my case. The problem was I knew I had been an internet guy, and they were used to being attacked from outside. I was attacking them from inside, so that really struck home. So there was a lot of vituperation. Uh, in fact, if you see the cover of my book, you'll see I have a blurb from Vint Cerf on my book in which he refers to me as a ranting gas bag. And what he didn't realize is that I would put that on my book. <laughs> he thought that when he, I asked him for the blurb, uh, Vint Cerf, father of the internet, he sent me back this nasty blurb, assuming I wouldn't put it there. <laughs> but I did. So there he is on the cover of my book, referring to me as a ranting gas bag because of my accusations about his baby being fragile and on the verge of collapse. Basically, everything I said, except the actual numerical prediction, is true. And um, I think the service I performed was sort of the self-denying prophecy. I got all sorts of people upset about various accusations I made, and they fixed the problems to some degree. Now, a lot of the fragility is still there. The spam problem is still out of control. Viruses are still a problem. We, you know, we grad students, when we were building the internet, did not put economics in, and we didn't put security in. And it's still not in, and there continue to be problems. And there are outages all the time, and no one's keeping very much track of them. So I claim I was sort of right. but. In 1996, came and went, and I ended up, I accepted an invitation to speak at the Worldwide Internet, some conference whose title was sort of like the Worldwide Internet Conference in Santa Clara, California, wherein I was expected to explain my failure to predict the collapse of the internet. So what I did is I <coughs> carefully arranged the most successful publicity stunt of my career as a columnist. I proposed it. I planned to eat my column. I, by the way, I had promised that I would eat my column if this prediction had not come true. So I decided that this, I accepted the speaking gig with the intent of making good on my promise and eating my column. But then I really, I, wow, I'm so proud of what I did. I, I, first of all, I rehearsed it. Eating paper is hard. In fact, you can't do it. It's, and not only that, it could be dangerous. Some paper is printed with heavy metals, and you don't want to be eating it. So I, first of all, InfoWorld, fortunately, was published with soybean-based inks with no heavy metals. I got that all verified. And then I, the night, the night before, actually, I actually ate the column, and I realized you can't try it. You can't. It's really horrible, and it could kill you. So I concocted a, um, I got a blender and some water and a bowl and a spoon. And so when I came, and they were in the podium when I came out on stage. So I come out on stage, there's a thousand of these internet, my people, my peeps, the internet intelligentsia, by, who were generally hostile to me by this time because of all my ranting, gas bag ranting. And um, so I began speaking and the audience was rumbling. And, and I said, well, you know, I made this prediction in 95 that the internet would collapse uh, last year. And it did, just like I said. Boo! They started booing because they could they could see me weaseling my way out of my commitment. I said, "Well, all right. I was close. I was within a factor of eight. You know, it was 118 megalapse instead of a gigalapse. That's close enough. I mean, it's within a factor of ten. Surely that should be enough." Audience growling, rumbling, shouts of derision coming. I said, oh, "Okay, okay. I'll eat my column." And I had them roll in a huge cake that looked like my column. It was my, you know, it had been, you know, with icing. It had been made to look exactly like my column. And I, so I went down and I started cutting cake and eating it and handing it out to people as if this would suffice. 
Then I went back to the podium and I'm eating the cake and the audience was not going to buy this. So they started yelling and you know that. So finally I, I said, all right, okay, all right. So I get my, um, got an actual copy of InfoWorld and I tore out the offending column and I showed it to the, went through the audience. Is this the column right here? Is this the one I promised to eat? And I got them all to agree that it was. And I took it up on the stage. And then I started tearing it up into little pieces. And then I reached down and I took the blender out. Of course, when I took the blender out, then they all realized I'd been planning this all along. And I took the bowl out and I put the water in the blender and I dumped the column in the blender and I blended it for a while and I poured it into the bowl to make. So I asked them, when you have soup, do you drink soup or do you eat soup? And I had to agree that you eat soup. So I was about to eat my column. You see, I didn't want to have a technicality. I didn't want to just drink it, because drinking is not the same as eating. So I got them to agree that eat, you eat soup, and that this was a soup, and it was my column. And then I proceeded to eat the whole thing, and then I held the bowl upside down over my head, the way you do with an empty beer stein, to prove that I had eaten the whole damn thing. Anyway, this made the cover of Barron's Magazine, it made articles in Wall Street Journal, in every big magazine picked this up. So pretty soon, this was such a successful journalistic pundit promotional event that I became better known for having falsely predicted the collapse of the internet and thereby eating my column than for inventing ethernet. That's how successful that PR stunt was. And, but generally, the community the net reaction was positive. That is, the fact that I actually ate the column was um, palliative. That is, people said, oh, well, no one ever does that. No one ever admits they were wrong. No one ever actually does that. And Metcalf did. He, he said he was wrong. He ate the column right in front of us. We were all there. So, uh, so not only that, not only did I manage to generate all this interest and all this, I think, preventative um, worry about what was broken about the internet, the self-denying prophecy, I in the end ended up um, getting a positive boost than a negative one on this. And uh, I'm reading all the time people referring to my uh, ill-fated prediction. I trust you had no ill effects from the meal? No. <laughs> I remember I ate the column twice. I ate the night before and then the day of and no ill effects. No to the extent that it was a self-denying prophecy and that you had a beneficial effect on fixing the internet, do you think the same kind of mechanism occurred a few years later in the Y2K issue? Yep, absolutely. All that uh, hype, which the press, I was a journalist at the time, a publisher even, that was great for us because it created controversy and it was self-denying. People were preparing for it long in advance and it didn't happen. Self-denying prophecy. You've been uh, critical of Microsoft as a monopolist in various, at various times, uh, but one of the things you once predicted was that when Windows 2000 gets here, becomes, uh, proliferates, that Linux would disappear. That hasn't happened. I didn't exactly predict that either. Okay. What I'm did sorry, you do you have the exact quote there? Do you want to read it to me? Uh, I, I think it said, that. when Windows 2000 gets here, goodbye Linux. Well, that was clearly wrong. <laughs> 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 goodbye Linux. Well, actually, that's not the, there are other predictions I've made. I've made, you know, I had to make a prediction a week, so I had, you know, eight times 50 predictions and so uh, you become a target <laughs> yeah I think my batting average is pretty good but that's one uh, that particular sentence I would have to regret on the other hand if you were reading the um, Linux media at that time Windows was doomed and and I'm sorry but Windows has not have you noticed Windows had a dropping off since I wrote that no and they were also falsely counting because Linux people generally didn't care about security. When you went to count Linux nodes in the network, there they all were. But Windows people are more serious people, and they, you know, they have businesses to run, stuff like that. They're not just grad students. I like to be nasty to open source Linux people. So they were undercounting the Windows machines and overcounting the Linux machines and claiming that Linux was taking over the world. And you know, Linux has been doing fine, but it hasn't killed Windows. And Vista just shipped today, and Vista's going to do just fine. So the, um, uh, I'm, I'm, 
negative on both Linux and Windows, frankly, um, because I believe they're 25 years old and they need serious fixing. Do you see any opportunities for something to replace them? I keep, I've keep i written uh, that I'm hoping that such a thing would occur, but now maybe it's going to happen through the evolution of Linux and the evolution of Vista, but if someone's going to come in completely new, it'll be on cell phones. And that that's happening now. Now there's, you know, five, ten operating systems on cell phones now, So that, and they're all not Windows. Most of them are not Windows or Linux. There's some Linux and there's some Windows, but there's some not. So that would be the next opportunity. And we're also pursuing the opportunity in the embedded space. There are 10 billion microcontrollers shipped every year, and there's no Windows for microcontrollers. There's 10 different uh, raggedy uh, embedded micro, uh, operating systems out there. So the opportunities for new OSs are probably in cell phones and embedded more than PCs, because PCs are kind of passe now. You know, they're, they're uh, clunkers. So maybe a oh. new operating system can evolve in some other <coughs> ecosystem and then expand out to the it's possible. But OSs are, they're too familiar to the, one, the software I dealt with in my technical prime. And that was in the you know, 60s and 70s and 80s. And why is that junk still around? Why, do I, why are we still telnetting? Why do we still have command lines? Windows and mice, were, we had those at Park in the, you know, the 70s. What's that stuff still doing around? And, and not only that, whenever the computer in this house goes awry, my wife expects me to fix it, and I can't. They're kludges. They're horrible, fragile things, and they're good enough for a billion people. So, so what have we done wrong in the industry that lets that happen? Well, not, not that we did anything wrong. It's just that the uh, the status quo in general in this whole process of technological innovation, which is what I believe my career is, technological innovation. The status quo is uh, strong and has lots of defenses, and um, so it's hard to innovate. You have to, there are barriers to entry to new innovations, and they're higher than they should be. And the, um, so just to go back to your mentioning of Microsoft. So I believe I wrote the first column attacking Microsoft for anti-competitive behavior, and I did it in Computer World, and I did it in 1991. And it was after my bad experience, direct experience with Microsoft at 3Com, where I w witnessed face up what it feels like to be on the receiving end. Now, I had previous experience with AT&T, but this was now Microsoft. And I didn't exactly criticize them for being monopolies exactly criticize them for anti-competitive behavior, which is different. That is, I think Microsoft has earned its monopoly. Where it went wrong is when it began to use its monopoly to deter competition and be a, a barrier to entry to new innovation. So, uh, for example, the famous example is when they introduced uh, Explorer. They didn't have to. They didn't have to use their monopoly and operating systems to kill Netscape. They could have killed Netscape, even Steven, fair and square. But instead, they bundled. They bundled Explorer with Windows in such a way, which is a violation of law. I mean, the Sherman, Clayton, one of those says you're not allowed to, and case law says you're not allowed to bundle. You're not allowed to take a monopoly position in one field and then bundle a non-monopoly product and thereby become a monopoly there. Someone realized a long time ago that that deters innovation and prevents new starts from innovative companies from coming along. So that's made illegal. So what Microsoft did wrong was not to succeed, and I think Bill Gates is a fine man. <coughs> it's, it's when they, when the, I referred to them as the Hitler youth, that was perhaps strong language, but the younger people at Microsoft believing, sort of trying to emulate Bill Gates, but not really getting it quite right. Gates is an ethical, hardworking, shrewd son of a bitch. And, but the Hitler youth, as I call them, they, they thought they were emulating Bill Gates when they started acting anti-competitively. And so they didn't have to bundle Explorer. They could have attacked Netscape fair and square with a little preparation to be sure that that competition could occur on the Windows platform. They could have done it that way. Instead, they chose to do it in an anti-competitive way. Another the thing that prompted my column in Computer World is I attended a press conference for the introduction of a, a pen-based operating system. What was it called? Go or some, some predecessor of Go. Eel. 
EO, some predecessor of EO, the one just before EO. The, anyway, it was a pen-based OS that it was being in San Francisco. I was a journalist. I went to the press conference. The day before, there had been a press conference to, in, by Microsoft to introduce pen windows. And it took all the air out of this press conference to introduce this pen-based operating system. And the thing that was true is there was no pen windows. Pen windows was, do you use a pen windows a lot? No, there never was pen windows. Microsoft saw that this little company was going to introduce a new operating system and scheduled a press conference the day before. That is anti-competitive behavior. And, and previously, IBM had been sued on this. They introduced the 360-90 in order to kill the CDC 6600. They didn't have whatever machine it was, the 90 or the 95. And the Justice Department said, no, you're not allowed to introduce fake products in order to disrupt the introductions of your competitors. No, bad monopoly. Not allowed to do that. Well, here's Microsoft doing it. They did it to this, this pen OS. That's what pr provoked my column. So just to be clear, I'm a t I have been and still do attack Microsoft, not for succeeding, but for turning its success into anti-competitive behavior, thereby slowing down the innovation process by deterring uh, new starts from from starting up. So it's okay to serve customers better. It's not okay to damage competition if you see the distinction. Do you see that anything has changed in the intervening 15 years? And do you predict anything might change uh, now that Gates is less involved? Well, first of all, Microsoft has been convicted of anti-competitive behavior. And that conviction is having its effect. That is, they're being sued still. And they're they're having to behave themselves a little better. So that as, as happened to IBM during its heyday. It cleaned up its, it was forced to clean up its act a little because of this um, legal action. Uh, Bomber is, uh, Bomber and Gates are of the same vintage. And so I, th I don't think, I don't think the company is, Bomber's an excellent guy. Gates is an excellent guy. I don't think the company is going to somehow get mediocre suddenly because Gates is, you know, doing his philanthropic thing. Uh, what we could, what was true of IBM in the '80s is that it was generally run by mediocre people. After years of monopoly, that's not true of Microsoft. These days, Microsoft is being run by and is attracting some of the best people in the world. So, it hasn't yet gone down the tubes, as I, I once predicted that it, Microsoft was going down the tubes, that I hastened to add it was going to be a, a long tube. <laughs> and uh, uh, see, I laugh at my own jokes. That's not, my wife complains about that. <laughs> but companies like Google are also hiring excellent people. And well, Google is sort of the, the you know, Microsoft's not going to last forever as the dominant player, because that, just look at the Roman Empire, you know, 500 years. That's sort of the upper limit. <laughs> so maybe Google's the one. But then right behind, what's going to happen right behind? Is it going to be Google forever? No, Google will somehow. But the time scales of these evolutions are way beyond a, the capability of covering a daily newspaper or a weekly magazine. They take decades. So it's hard to be right about them. So after a decade of uh, being a journalist, you decided to move on to another phase of your career and become a venture capitalist. Describe why it is you did that and why you thought you could do a good job at it. Uh, I have a short attention span. It's about 10 years, roughly. So after about 10 years, I sort of want to do something new. And that's what happened. I did journalism and publishing for 10 years. And I was doing a column on this company. And uh, it's in a funny place. They gave me directions. I like to write about new technology. One of the things I like to do for my readers was to say, this is going to be really important. So I like to, and a, my idea of a scoop was to identify a technology before other people had written about it. So that's why I ended up writing about a lot of startups, because that's where you'd find such a thing. And I once heard about this startup called Eucentric in um, Maynard, Massachusetts. And they gave me the directions, out route to left, right, left, right. And I realized they were directions to the mill, the old deck mill. If they should have just said, come to the deck mill, but they didn't know that that shorthand was available. And here was the mill packed with cars, like it had been in the old days of deck, only there was no more deck. It was just some, you know, 100 startups had 
infiltrated the mill. So here I am interviewing this company, Eucentric, and there was a venture capitalist, Mike Hirschland, sitting there, which is kind of odd. I'm interviewing a company and their VC is there. And I spent quite well, most of a day there, and at the end of it, Hirschland invited me to come visit him over at his VC firm, Polaris. And next thing I know, I'm a venture partner there. And I, um, they invited me, and, I, and what I viewed that was is a transition of it, <coughs> technological innovation is still my business, but this is a new role. So instead of <coughs> helping people to better buy information technology, I was going to go start some companies. Keeping dealing with entrepreneurs, who are my favorite people, on engineer, scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs are my favorite people, roughly speaking. So I could, you know, there's a four-way deal there. The scientists develop the scientists, the engineers, they make it into products, the entrepreneurs organize the companies, and the VCs fund them. And that's part of the innov technological innovation process. So I viewed it as a way to keep in that business, but from a different point of view. And just as I had learned how to sell advertising, I was now going to learn how to be a venture capitalist, which is a completely different trade craft involved there. Did you think that your experience having started your own company would help you evaluate and mentor these startups? And has that been true? One of the conceits of my practice as a VC is I think that. I think that having built a company, I'm in a better position to choose and help companies. Uh, but along those lines, I think in the last six years, I've learned that I'm, I need to be putting more time in choosing than helping. There's only a certain amount of helping you can do, and if you've made a bad choice to begin with, it's very hard to help a bad choice into success. It's much better to put the energy into selection than helping. So one of the things I've done in my early years as a VC is be chairman of the board, which is something VCs don't do a lot of. I did more of it because I thought I was more qualified because I had been a chairman, an actual chairman of the board. And I'm doing that less now. I'm retreating from that role because it, it, it was a conceit that I could be so helpful to these companies and that as an investor, I need to pay more attention. I'm going to help, keep helping, of course, but that I need to put more emphasis on choosing than helping. Do you find it frustrating that in your role you provide the funding and you provide advice, um, but they don't sometimes listen to your advice? They don't? Sometimes they don't listen to my advice? <laughs> How about sometimes they do listen to my <laughs> advice? Rarely. Uh, no, I, see, I had 10 years as a journalist where I was giving advice to a million people and they weren't listening. So now I give advice to a much smaller group and they're not listening. It's pretty much the same thing. I try to be helpful. I, uh, and one of my sources of compensation is to be acknowledged for having, oh, that was a great thing, or thanks for that help. And, so I do try to help the companies, and I look for, but you're right, it, uh, I have a portfolio now. So I have eight companies. Well, we have a hundred and some companies that all of us look for. I have eight that I sort of pay careful attention to. So I have to be careful that in each of those eight cases, the people I'm dealing with there, they have one company that they're interested in, and they're one-eighth of my portfolio, and that requires a different mindset. I mean, they're in charge. I can advise. I can invest or not invest or advise, but ultimately it, uh, it's those teams that make or break the companies. The, the shortage, by the way, I've learned in six years, the shortage, the scarce commodity in my practice is not money. There's plenty of venture capital. Don't let anyone tell you there's not enough venture capital around. There's billions of it. It's gobs of it. And there's no shortage of ideas. MIT alone generates enough ideas you could start a company a week. The shortage is CEOs, that is people who can start those companies and grow them. They're, they're the, if we had more CEOs, we could fund more companies and there would be more innovation. You said that one of the critical things is to select well. Uh, is, is it, do I take it then that the selection of the team is even more important than the selection of the idea? Well, yeah, this is a perpetual debate in venture capital. Is it the market? Is it the people? Uh, what's the third one? Or is it the technology? You know, which is it? Of course, you have to have all three. And so um, I guess what I just said was tantamount to saying the people are the most important of those three. And I guess, yeah, you would argue that a, a, a good team, 
stands a better chance of making the most of the situation. Um, on the other hand, if the team is in a losing situation, there's not much they can do. So you find a lot of mediocre people who just happen to be in the right market and they look like geniuses. Well, sometimes a good team can change the situation when they see it's not working into one that will work. And that's what I tell our teams. Occasionally the team will say, our market is not really taking off. And I say, aren't you a leader in the market? Yeah, we're the leader in the market. So the fact that the market isn't taking off is your fault. So make the market take off. What do you have to do to make, don't tell me the market's not taking off, make it take off. And that's to your point. That the, but there are some, there's luck involved. And you see some mediocre teams who stumble into these huge vortexes and they all look like geniuses and you don't really know they're not geniuses till later. And then there are the really good teams that owing to the ebbs and flows of luck end up in a losing situation and uh, there's nothing they can do. So it's, uh, so it's a very, venture capital is a very specialized, very uh, subtle um, trade and I'm still learning it after six years. What sort of companies are you responsible for uh, at Polaris? Are they mostly communications and networking, or have you branched out? The reason I'm, uh, a key reason I'm at Polaris is Polaris is diversified. That's our number one strategy. So we are not a dot-com VC firm, or even a telecom firm, or even a com IT firm. We're diversified across technologies, including life sciences, drug delivery, medical devices, enterprise software, networking, networking hardware, networking software. It goes on. We're diversified. So, um, but still, my eight companies tend to be close to closer to what I know about. There is a a notable exception, which I'd like to get to, but so I'm in. Um, uh, I'm in a company. I'm chairman of a company called Ember that networks embedded microcontrollers, of which, uh, as I mentioned, 10 billion are shipped every year. That's sort of a recapitulation of 3Com networking of a layer of computers. PCs were new. 3Com went to network PCs, and we succeeded, and the rest is history. Now embedded computers are coming, so we're, we're developing CMOS radios and protocols appropriate for the 10 billion mi embedded microcontrollers. Not a new field. People like uh, uh, Echelon have been trying to do this for a long time. They have. It's not a new field, but it's still a new field. Uh, Echelon is a fine company, but they're not doing the job. There's still 10 billion unnetworked microcontrollers out there, the, the pitiful fraction that they've managed to network. They're, they're hung up on wiring. You're not going to network those 10 billion microcontrollers with wires. I'm sorry. And Echelon is, they keep writing articles about how wireless doesn't work. It reminds me of columns I wrote in the 90s when wireless didn't work in the early 90s. I wrote columns. Wire, actually, I went a little overboard. I said wireless will never work, which is going too far. But now I'm on the other side, and Echelon, the problem with Echelon, a fine company, in fact, 3Com almost merged with Echelon, and Ken Oshman's a fine man, and Mike Markle is a genius, and it's a great company, but they're stuck on wiring. They better get off wiring, or Little Ember and a bunch of other companies are going to pass them by, because those 10 billion embedded controllers need to be wirelessly networked. It's clear. The cables are too expensive, for one thing. I'm too big. So uh, Echelon better get with it. What other companies in your portfolio that are interesting? Oh, well, they're all interesting, all eight of them. Um, uh, I've, I've just recently stepped down as chairman, but I'm still a director. This is part of my altering role. I've recruited a great chairman for Cycortex, maker of um, supercomputers, open source Linux clusters. Open source? I've never been a fan source. of open source. I'm flexible. It's much, it's much more important <laughs> to be right than to be consistent. <laughs> so Psycortex says um, there's an emergent in supercompute, technical, scientific supercomputing, not enterprise computing. There's an emergent platform. It's called Linux MPI, open source. These are people, the reason Linux is a special, open source is a special attraction to these folks. These are people who own their own codes. They don't buy software. They write their own. It's very technical. Uh, they don't buy Oracle databases, they, uh, they write their own codes, and so recompiling the OS is something that they really love to do several times a day, probably. So Psycortex has noticed the emergence of this Linux MPI platform into the top 500 supercomputers in the world and decided, well, 
they're, they're cobbling these clusters together out of old PCs using Ethernet as a fabric. So let's preserve the platform, but put a purpose-built hardware underneath it. So we'll execute MPI over Linux and run Linux um, uh, better, faster, cheaper. Improving delivered performance by factors of 10 per dollar per foot per watt. And we start out with a micro process, 64-bit floating point microprocessor that has less than a watt of power consumption instead of more than 100 watts of power consumption. There's a factor of 100 there that we're starting with. And then we have a fabric which replaces Ethernet in the, uh, type, in, in the cabinet. And it's integrated on the chip. So the core of this company is a chip. And then we put the chips on boards, and we put the boards on boxes, and we sell the boxes. And, uh, and so we're, our mission is to deliver, is a tera flops for milliwatts. And uh, that's really cool. So we're, and, that, and sh the chip just came back from TSMC a few weeks ago, and is now running Linux and sending packets. And I got an email from one of the guys uh, running Linux on this chip. So we'll be shipping computers this year, and that's exciting. It's an exciting field, but of course it's a field that's littered with the corpses of a lot of companies that didn't make it. Right, and hybrid. the people who work at Psycortex were at all those companies that didn't make it, and they learned three lessons. See, three? Isn't that recurring? Three? Three lessons. Three mistakes we're not going to make. We're not designing our own microprocessor. We're not developing our own operating systems and tools, and we are not asking our customers to reprogram their applications. So we plan to do this company on 50 million instead of 500 million. You mentioned that one of your eight companies was not in the computing communications field. What is that? Oh, well, another, uh, yes, I've, uh, I've noticed that one of the big problems in the world today is energy. The world needs cheap and clean energy. Cheap and clean, not just cheap, not just clean, but cheap and clean energy. The world needs it. Other people have noticed this too. A lot of people have noticed it, but I've noticed it. And I've noticed that too many of the people who have noticed it are Luddites and Greens and Marxists and politicians and lawyers and people who are in no position to solve the problem. However, scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists, we can solve the problem. So just like it took us 30 years to break the back of the communication monopolies and build the internet, we are going to take the next 30 years to break the back of the uh, energy monopolies and solve the world's needs, uh, meet the world's needs for clean and cheap energy. Cheap and clean, cheap and clean, both, has to be both. Can't be just cheap, can't be just clean, it's got to be cheap and clean. So uh, this investment, my first energy, I've sort of made two. But the first one is called Green Fuel, it's an MIT spinoff, which is one of my specialties is hanging around MIT and looking for opportunities. Listen to what green fuel does. It takes the flue gases from power plants, oil, gas, coal, and bubbles the flue gases through a slurry of algae in the sun. The algae eat all of the CO2 and all of the NOx from the flue gases so that the resulting effluent is free of greenhouse gases. And then by eating this CO2 and NO2, the algae double in mass every few hours so that once a day you're able to harvest them. And then from the lipids you produce biodiesel, and from the starches you produce ethanol, and from the proteins you produce food, feed. Thereby killing two birds with one stone, solving not solving, but contributing to the reduction of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, and thereby uh, the alleged impact on global warming. And second of all, producing this huge revenue stream of biofuels. And uh, so I've just been to the Phoenix, the desert of Arizona, and watching them build their third generation, slightly scaled up, now about a third of an acre. Uh, these are, are high-tech greenhouses, basically, that take a lot of acreage. Um, ultimately thousands of acres next to the power plants to, con to recycle their CO2 into biofuels. Isn't that cool? That's cool. <laughs> it depends on the existence of these old technology power plants in order to... Well, you think those power plants are going to go away tomorrow? They're planning to build hundreds of gigawatt coal plants in the United States and China. 
coal is the cheapest fossil fuel available, it's also the dirtiest. So green fuel is a way to use coal without putting the CO2 in the atmosphere. So I'm sorry if you're thinking that I'd love for, them, for us to build a thousand nuclear power plants in the United States as soon as possible, and that's a whole separate argument. But uh, that's a whole separate argument. In the meantime, green fuel is going to make it, it um, cheap and clean. Cheap because of the excess, the recycling, the CO2 is not a pollutant. It's a valuable plant food, and we're recycling it. So there's great value generated and clean. So cheap and clean has been the green fuel proposition. Just, let's just hope they succeed. <laughs> Good luck with it. You said you had another company that was an energy? Yeah, on the other company? end. So that's in the generation side. So there's generation, transmission, storage, and consumption. On the consumption side, we've invested in a battery company. I'm sorry, in the storage side. Well, it's actually in the consumption side, too, when you think about it. But these are micro batteries. So there's a lot of battery companies, uh, you know, electric cars and other worthwhile activities. This is a micro battery company that makes batteries as thin as a postage stamp. They're indestructible, infinitely rechargeable, thin film, lithium ion, solid state batteries used in embedded applications, embedded again to power those 10 billion microcontrollers. And those would be used for energy management and security and a million other applications, convenience, smart cards, uh, cell phones, and so on. Not the main battery in the cell phone, the backup battery in the cell phone, the real-time clock battery. Uh, we have a solution for that, so we hope to ship billions of those soon. Uh, for those eight companies, you serve as the primary VC um, liaison. Um, from Polaris from to them, Polaris. there are other VCs involved in all of them. So, there are, so you work as a team in Polaris. You're 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 not an individual uh, investor with. No, in there portfolio. are 14 of us. We meet weekly. We um, consult on all investments. There is specialization. Uh, so I have these eight companies that I'm responsible for. Um, but it's highly consultative with the team. And then at the company, there's other VCs. So the board is usually a syndicate of two, three, or four or five other investors. So are you enjoying it? Do you think you'll fill out your decade-long attention span uh, being a VC? Oh, yes. Uh, I want to be the best venture capitalist there ever was. I want to be better than Vinod uh, and John and uh, Don and you Arthur. Know, <laughs> Arthur. And don't, yeah, let's not stop. Let's go to Arthur and you know all those guys. I want to be better than them, or at least as good. Because there's fun in you know mastering something and being good at it, and uh, I haven't been at it long enough to really. Uh, I'm not expert enough. I refuse to give talks on how to be a good venture capitalist because I don't know yet. But I'll start giving those talks in a couple of years, I figure. And um, I haven't begun thinking about why, what my career will be after that, but I will in three or four years. What other uh, activities are you involved in? I know that you have been or are still on the MIT board. Yes, I'm a life trustee of MIT, and it's enormously important and fun work. And, uh, and as a result of that affiliation, I'm on the board of Technology Review Magazine. I'm, on the, uh, I'm the chairman of the leadership board of the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT. I'm on the visiting committee of the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. And I'm active in a lot of the, the many entrepreneurial activities, the 100K competition, the, the um, uh, idea stream conferences. Uh, MIT has an elaborate infrastructure for encouraging and supporting entrepreneurship, and I'm very active in that. Are you doing any teaching these days? I give an occasional lecture. I don't, I don't have any response. Today, for example, I'm giving a, a guest a talk at a seminar at Boston University up the street here, the history department. And I sometimes talk at MIT about, I gave a recent talk on collective intelligence, as if I knew something about that, related to Metcalfe's Law. See Metcalfe's Law and collective intelligence. You can see how they might be related. Mm -hmm. uh, I give a talk uh, f repeatedly, you know, once every year or two on writing, the importance of writing and engineering. I don't talk to the people who write at MIT. I talk to the engineers who don't. Convincing them that to be an en not to be a writer, but to be an engineer, you have to know how to write and speak. 
And that's, they think it's like a choice. I can either be an engineer or I can write and talk. And no, 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 you don't understand. You can't be a good engineer without writing and talking. So I give that speech now and then. And I often, um, too often actually, I like speaking and I get invited a lot, so I do too much of it. Along the lines of your advice to engineers to learn how to write, what other career advice would you give to people who want to be involved in high technology? in terms of what sort of education to get, what sort of first job to get? Well, the first advice to give is that you should be in science and technology. That is, technological innovation is the source of all progress. So you should be in the technological innovation business, at the core of which is science and engineering, science engineering management, I would say. So you should be in that. It's the highest calling is to be in technological innovation. Democracy, freedom, prosperity, they all stem from technological innovation. All of it, I'm sorry. And if you disagree with me, fine. You can have freedom of speech guarantees your right to say so, but I disagree with you. So you should be in science and technology and math, and that's where to be. That's where the action is, and the world needs more of us. Uh, second, uh, you do need to learn how to communicate. In addition to your technological, scientific, managerial expertise. Part and parcel of that is knowing how to communicate, how to speak, how to write, how to... I like to give a lecture on the importance of being the person they choose to stand at the whiteboard. How that is a, um, a control position and an important position in the evolution of ideas. Being the person, they say, Bob, would you stand at the whiteboard and write down what we're saying? That's a job you want. You have to have good penmanship. But then you have to respect the control you have, because what you write down is a paraphrase of what you've heard, and how you choose to paraphrase it is all important in the evolution of that conversation. And that's a, one of the control points in um, moving things forward. Being good at that is important both to the team you're on, but also your own advancement. And then I like to um, write about and give speeches about selling. The uh, typical tragic flaw of scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs, is, especially technologically oriented ones, is they think salespeople suck. Salespeople are stupid and fat and suit, empty suits. They're lower than whales, whatever. And that is a tragic misconception. Salespeople are a different form of life, I will grant you that. But they are every bit as important and skilled as engineers and scientists. And if you try to start a company and not have any salespeople, that's the end of your company, generally speaking. So I give that pitch a lot, that nothing happens until something gets sold. So you better learn how to sell. Sell your ideas as an engineer or a scientist. I mean, how do you think people get Nobel Prizes? Do you think they just sit in their labs and people all say, this person should get a Nobel Prize? No, when you look behind these Nobel Prizes. There's a sales campaign out there organized by the university or the contributor. Uh, so if you really want a Nobel Prize, you got to learn how to sell. You're not going to get the Nobel Prize. That's just the way it is. I'm sorry. And uh, so selling is important. I give that pitch. And then the special nature of small companies versus large companies. I have a whole spiel about that. You know, for example, small company in small companies, the company grows faster than the person, whereas in a big company, it's the other way around. It, and what does that mean? What do you do differently? Well, recruiting is important. You don't, you don't hire people. I always, this is a pet peeve of mine. They say, well, we're going to hire a CEO. Well, I'm sorry, you don't hire good CEOs. Hire sort of connotes, there's a long line of people applying for the job, and you're going to interview them and choose which one. Well, it's not like that. If you want a good CEO, you've got to go out and recruit them. You don't hire them. So that's part of my spiel on the difference of small companies versus big companies. Would you recommend to people at the early stages of their career that they get some experience in large companies before getting into small companies? I do. Well, I say you should get your, complete your education and um, do graduate work at a big company. And then the smart Alex say, well, what about Michael Dell, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates? What about them? They, they dropped out of college and they never worked for a big company. And I say, well, those are what we call exceptions to the rule. <laughs> and uh, so you sh so I have a principle, as a venture capitalist, I have a moral imperative. I never induce anyone to leave school to start a company. It's just a rule I have. I consider it immoral to do that. 
So for example, the case of Ember, the founder there, Rob Poor, was a grad student when I met him and he said, I want to start a company. I said, well, I'll talk to you as soon as you get your PhD, which he then did. So I feel good about that. I could have said, oh really, you want to start a company? Huh? What would it be like? Have you written a business plan? Would you like to come over and have lunch with me? Da, 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 and start the whole process. I wouldn't allow myself to do it because it's complete your education, go as far as you can, as fast as you can in your education, and um, go to graduate school at a big company and learn how companies work, and then you're qualified to start your company. Would you recommend people to concentrate on the computer technology, or do you think that it's uh, so far along in its evolution that um, biomedicine is the area, the hot area for the next few years? There are many um, ways to live, and so you have to be careful. For example, I don't mean to say that being an entrepreneur or a technological innovator is the only viable lifestyle. Similarly, to say that bio has eclipsed info as the place to be, I sort of feel that's true, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot to be done in info. And in bio is going nowhere without info, because now bio is info. So, um, But I have to admit that were I um, entering graduate school now, I would be in something bio. And if not bio, something chemo. And if not chemo, something material -o, you know, nano. I'd admit, I admit that, but there's a lot of info. And all, in fact, all of those fields are largely now info, so it's really hard to be in any of those without also being info. My favorite example of that is Eric Lander, MIT, the guy who played a key role in sequencing the genome. You know, he's an information technologist who used to be at the Harvard Business School. And you know, here he is sequencing the genome. How did that happen? Uh, and it's because info and bio are in, almost inseparable now, and that's true of almost everything. So I guess it's still a good idea to know it, to know info. So I'm trying to get a, a um, teacher chair endowed at my s daughter and son's prep school out here, and I'm and they're at a snooty New England prep school, and they're interested in the liberal arts, and the trustees are resisting me because they view computer programming as a trade craft. I'm making the argument that computer programming is a liberal art now. And that if you need to have some base level of literacy and literally computer programming, that's a liberal art now. The definition of liberal art was not frozen in 1492, you know, it's evolved. And computer programming is now a liberal art. So it should be taught at this little prep school. So we're going to endow a chair there and get a teacher and teach computer science to these kids. Thank you.